Yes. Yeah. So is it okay to delay a bit as we yes. we allow more people to to come in? Of course. It's okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. So Carlito, how is the weather in California? Uh, right now it's about 90. 90 but, degrees, yeah? Yeah, but, but it's dry. 90 in California is really pleasant. So. You're, you're more inside as compared to San Francisco, is about that? So yeah, San Francisco is, yeah, San Francisco is always like 30 degree 60. difference. Yeah, 65 degrees. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the summer it's 30 degrees lower, and in the winter it's 30 degrees higher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of my daughters is in Oakland. She lives here in Oakland. Yeah, oh, in Oakland? She, oh yeah. Yeah. But uh, I think she's, she has just been staying in her apartment uh, since March. Oh yeah, because of COVID. Because of COVID, yeah. We've actually been, uh, we bought an RV two years ago. And so we've actually been driving everywhere. <laughs> we, went <Yeah>. to Yellowstone, <laughs> we went to Yellowstone, went to Oregon a couple of times. Nice, it's nice. Are we about to begin? Oh, pretty close. Yeah, so uh, maybe Richmond uh, could start playing the. We will, um, Edsel, we will delay a bit the playing okay. of the video. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there are 13 of us, uh, uh, you know, on the end. So we'll, we'll allow some people to come in. Maybe they're just a bit. You know, this, uh, the thing is in the, in the Philippines now, I uh, sorry, at least in Metro Manila, we are back to a modified enhanced uh, war community quarantine. So we're total, a bit total lockdown again. Oh, so, you're, in, you're in lockdown again. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, modify, which means we have to get our quarantine passes again. There are checkpoints and all this stuff. So beginning today until the 18th of uh, August. So that runs uh -huh. for, for two weeks. So we are, the cases here has been rising very fast. Uh, I mean, you know, significant numbers of uh, new cases every day. Yep, so, yep, yep. yeah. So I think the people are starting to, again, go back to that time when, you know, when mm -hmm. we had to buy the stuff, uh, you know, again, for a longer period, you know. Because yeah. uh, we are re we are restricted to, to to leave the houses only for essential purposes. So probably that's the reason why there are some delays. That's some delays, people yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, but uh, 
we should be okay soon. In the U.S., I think some states are, are reconsidering the uh, opening, so we might close things again, because the cases in uh, the southern states have been increasing. In oh. South Carolina, it has been increasing. Yeah. All right. California, too, I think. <clears throat> really? I think California, that's what uh, Texas, Florida is the worst. So, so I don't know how the universities... Uh, are going to open up uh, this fall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hi, Carlita. Hey, who was that? Al. <laughs> oh, hey, Al. Oh. <laughs> Al. <clears throat> Al, is, Al is always a cheerful man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, stay positive, man. <laughs> <laughs> Al, I think... Let me know. Al, let me know when you come to San Francisco again. I got my uh, my old Porsche running. I'll give you. I'll ah, I'll you, you man. I'll <laughs> you. I am bringing my little red one there soon. Yeah, I was planned was supposed to be in November. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully let's let's no shut down. Yeah, uh, let's take it out for a spin. I'd love to. I'd love to be able to go even just around the Oregon. Get some Peter Noir going. Or I yeah. said Peter Noir, that, that's that's good in Oregon, right? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, they, they have good Pinot Noir. Oh, oh Pinot Noir, yeah. yeah. Yeah, of course, California. Hi, yeah. hi Pedro. Yeah. Long time no see. It's almost five years, man. It's, it's <laughs> Francis, I think. It's well, Francis was there. You still look good. Young, yeah, you too. Mm. You look very professional. <laughs> well, because I had to put on my, you know, <laughs> your time. Well, you're sleepy, yeah. <laughs> so, this so folks are now trickling in. We have about 19 uh, members okay. in the yeah. audience right now. Yeah, uh, Richmond uh, should be. Hey, Pedro, also... haven't seen you in years. Oh, also, hey, sir. your neighbors. And you don't see each other? <laughs> no, he hasn't attended any of the recent meetings and parties. How have you been, Pedro? I'm doing well. Next time you have a party, me, I'll show. Sure. <laughs> if you invite me, I'll show. I will okay. be there. That's a promise. <laughs> yes. Yes. Not right invitation. now because of COVID, but uh, soon. I thought Jose was always ready to party. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm getting we miss your jokes. We miss your jokes. <laughs> I just gave a he, joke earlier. He just told. He just told a good joke just five minutes ago. I missed it. <laughs> he could repeat it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the share, and then uh, uh, maybe Richmond could uh, start playing that uh, introduction. I'm gonna go powder my nose. See you later, guys. No sound. I don't hear any sound. Rich Mohan? The video has no sound. Richmond, we didn't hear any sounder. Yeah, I I uh, reminded him.
So, <clears throat> Albin, what happened there? There was no sound. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, asked uh, Richmond to replay the video. Okay, thank you. Science and technology and innovation, these are indispensable in the modern economy, in the modern world. We held a meeting at the MSI and uh, we resolved among about six to eight of us, local members, first to form ASA Philippines so that we could continue to host uh, meetings here, but also to go on a massive campaign to um, uh, try to get support from uh, the national government uh, through the uh, legislative and executive uh, branches to invest more in science and technology. So um, it started with uh, a white paper, a position paper that we co-authored among uh, six of us, namely uh, Ernie Pernia, Cesar Salama, Rador Asansa, Toby Dairita Fateneo, and um, Alvin Colaba of De La Sal and myself. So, Paase, historically, um, in the past uh, 10, 20 years for sure, uh, have been collaborating with um, our counterparts here in the Philippines at various universities. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these interactions probably started as peer to peer. Uh, but thankfully, we have the Department of Science and Technology here in the Philippines, and they've come up with some really uh, helpful and uh, very impactful programs. That actually enable ASE members that are based uh, in the United States and other parts of the world to actually come here and do extensive uh, research and academic partnerships and collaborations. Well, I think that um, one of the good things that uh, PAASE is doing is really trying to stay in touch with the researchers and the scientists here in the Philippines. So I think that is one of the good programs that they keep on supporting some of the initiatives of our researchers and scientists here in the country, trying to align also their, their assistance towards the, uh, the plans of the Philippine government. It's very important that the uh, PASA members and scientists based in the Philippines are continuously in contact so we will know the needs of you know, the Filipinos and opportunities that Filipinos can have to uh, do science with their PASA counterparts. So the, these interactions such as the conference that we're holding and the annual conferences that we have. The Philippines and the scientists there have a very unique perspective that adds to discoveries and inventions advancing, uh, in general, the field. These members, because they are part of an academy, it implies that they are productive. So they have publications, they have innovations, they have inventions, patents, and they have, um, you know, they have an impact on society, okay? So uh, these are the people who can convince government, you know, invest more in science and technology. And that was really the gist of our paper, our position paper in 2000. And it is uh, uh, Ernie Pernia who said that R&D by nature is expensive and it is a public good. So it is important for the government to take the lead in uh, investing in R&D. To increase the economic growth potential of the country, we cannot continue to just uh, rely on traditional inputs into production as capital and labor. We also need to develop our expertise in science and technology and innovation so that we can come up with uh, new systems new ways of doing things. 
I think that uh, science, uh, researchers, industry, and even the government is really like an ecosystem of knowledge. So I think it doesn't really matter if you're coming from a private institution or a public institution such as um, a state university. I think we all have a role to play to improve the research capabilities and scientific knowledge here in the country. I think it is about time for us um, to realize that one of our roles as academics, as researchers, as scientists, is to actually contribute to that global uh, body of knowledge. And the role of this uh, cooperation among these government agencies really is to be able to attract uh, science and technology global-based companies to set up shop here. And that is really key in terms of developing the science and technology innovation ecosystem in the country. Uh, particularly because there's that deep desire. And what PASE does and can do more of is to promote this relationship between its members. We really need to ratchet up the appreciation, the recognition of the importance of science and technology and innovation. And um, we are all um, trying to um, uh, attain what we call uh, the common good. The, the greater, higher, long-term good of the Filipino people. Okay, I think that, uh, that ends that video, okay? So, uh, I think we're going to start this uh, plenary session number three. I'm uh, Ed Salpena. I'm a professor at the University of South Carolina, and uh, I haven't been here in the U.S. for quite some time. It's my pleasure to host this session. And uh, we will have three speakers later, uh, and this is on health, food, and nutrition. But before that, we have a very important event, which is the uh, conferment of the co-award in science. And uh, we will start that by having our board of directors chair, Dr. Carlito Librela to give a short, brief introduction, and then uh, a video presentation, and then the confirmant of the award. Uh, Carlita? Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Not yet, just the preliminary. <laughs> yes, I'd like to uh, welcome right. everyone to um, the, the uh, the, the highlight of the conference, which is the presentation of the, the co-award for, um, uh, for, for science. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a this is a, uh, uh, the, the mm -hmm. ultimate award that's awarded, by, that's provided by uh, Paase. And, um, and well, <laughs> I just like to, to welcome everyone and, and um, look forward to today's speaker. And he is one of the speakers later, too. Yeah, Carlito. Yeah. So, uh, Albin, would you like to play the, the video presentation? Yeah. Richmond, please. Thank you. Danilo Angeles Tagle, the 2020 Severino and Co. Lectureship Award in Science. Dan was born and raised in Quezon City, Philippines. His parents hailed from Cavite and Bataan. Second in the brood of seven, his family migrated to North America in the early 80s in Detroit, Michigan. There he earned his bachelor's degree in biological sciences and an MS in Population Genetics at the Wayne State University. In 1990, he received his PhD in Molecular Biology and Genetics at the WSU School of Medicine under the mentorship of the renowned molecular evolutionist, Dr. Morris Goodman. He was also a postdoctoral fellow in Human Genetics under the guidance of Dr. Francis S. Collins, a world-class geneticist at the University of Michigan. In 1993, he was recruited to join the NIH as an investigator and section head of molecular neurogenetics 
at the National Human Genome Research Institute as part of the Human Genome Project. His laboratory was involved in the highly collaborative efforts towards the position of cloning of genes for Huntington's disease, ataxia telangiectasia, and Neiman Pick type C disease. He then became program director for neurogenetics in 2001 at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, where he developed research programs in inherited brain disorders. In 2011, he joined the newly established National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences, or NCATS, as Associate Director for Special Initiatives. He develops catalytic and innovative solutions to scientific challenges and blazes new fields of research that includes the NIH Microphysiological Systems ACRA Tissue Chip Program. These cutting-edge and transformative activities involve coordination with other NIH institutes and centers, as well as partnerships with other government agencies, such as FDA, DARPA, NASA, and the private sector. Dana served as chair of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the Philippine Genome Center, also as Ken Katz Advisory Council Executive Secretary and member Pure's Acceleration Network Review Board. He was on the editorial board of the journal Gene, as well as International Journal of Biotechnology. With more than 150 scientific publications, H index of 35, he has garnered numerous awards and patents, including the prestigious 2019 Roscoe O'Brady Award for Innovation Accomplishment and the Henry J. Hendrich Award for Innovative Medicine. Central to Dan's accomplishments and goals in developing disaster technologies is engaging key resources and expertise through partnerships with various stakeholders in biomedical research. So <clears throat> we're going to proceed with the conferment of the award, uh, Alvin. Yes, uh, Giselle will uh, read the uh, uh, certificate of uh, recognition. Giselle, please. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, before uh, the conferment, I would like us to uh, thank again uh, Dr. Severino and Pasco for bestowing um, this um, annual award to outstanding scientists and engineers in Paase. So, Dr. Severino Ko is one of the founding fathers of the Paase in 1980, and he was an eminent professor emeritus of engineering. So on behalf of uh, ASE, we would like to thank the family of Dr. Severino and Paz Co. On behalf of the PASE and the PASE board, I am deeply honored to present this certificate of award to Dr. Danilo A. Tagle, PhD, the 2020 Severino and Pasco Lectureship Award in Science, given this day, August 4, 2020, during the 40th Pase anniversary and 2020 APAMS Manila, Philippines. Signed, Gisela P. Concepcion, President, 2020. Alvin Culaba, Chair, Paase Committee on Severino and Paz Call Lectureship Awards 2020, attested by Lourdes Gerald, PhD, Paase President, Paase Secretary 2020. Congratulations, Dan, and here is your certificate. 
Thank you, Giselle. First word is Dan receiving. Wow. Thank you. And Dan, here's your $1,000 check. Uh, I can keep it if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Alvin. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Dan. Congratulations, Dan. Congratulations, Dan. Uh, very, very well deserved. And uh, you're now a member of the select group of BASI members that have uh, received the co awards. And uh, the three speakers in this session are actually all co, -co research co awardees, uh, just like you. So, so that's uh, really wonderful. So, we're going to start with uh, the talks now. And uh, let me share my screen for my introductions uh, of the speakers. Uh, see. Okay, so, uh, so before I introduce the first speaker, which will be Dr. Tagli, our new awardee, uh, let me just mention some of the ground rules for our uh, session, uh, because there's a lot of uh, big feedback sometimes. Uh, we're going to switch up all our microphones, except for the speaker. And then uh, uh, you could ask questions and uh, you could type that in the chat box. Or if you want, uh, you could raise your hand uh, later and we could allow you to ask your questions through video or in person. Uh, there will be a question and answer session after Dr. Tagli's talk. And then the next one will be after Dr. Pedro Jose, Dr. Carlito Librella's talk. So, so, uh, so we're going to start, let me just uh, introduce a little bit more Dan. Okay, of course, uh, I'll be uh, presented a very nice video about him, about his life. And uh, I think I'm going to repeat uh, some of them here. Now, uh, I really like this picture of Dan here. Uh, the, on the left side, he's in front of uh, the famous monument. And I think that's Luneta Park. And uh, that must be Jose Rizal in, the, in that monument. But if you look at the picture on the right, Dan really looks like Jose Rizal. So, and uh, the first time he sent me this picture, I said, I know this guy. And then it turns out that I, I was remembering to see results. So, so Dr. Hagley <laughs> has very much uh, in relation with our national hero, which is uh, uh, Jose Rizal. So it's nice to be, to be young and have uh, good hair. And there you could see the resemblance with our national hero. Dan? <laughs> okay, so uh, I think uh, Albin had uh, mentioned this, but uh, just to go over a little bit about uh, Dr. Tagli's educational and professional backgrounds. Uh, in high school, he was in Latran. Uh, I remember my classmates in Philippine science. There were some of them who went to Latran, aside from, of course, UP in Ateneo. Uh, and then he studied at the University of Santo Tomas. But before he completed his degree in Santo Tomas, his family immigrated to the US. And so he completed his degree, bachelor's degree in biology in Wayne State University in Detroit. And then he also completed his uh, master's degree at Wayne State University. And then he proceeded to pursue his PhD in the same university, and he completed his uh, PhD in molecular biology and genetics in 1990. Then uh, he went to Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is, uh, Ann Arbor is about uh, 4, 20 to 30 miles from Detroit. So, so this must be very convenient for him because he took an NIH NRSA postdoc at the University of Michigan. Uh, now, this is a very prestigious uh, postdoctoral fellowship that very many people get this, and uh, you have to have an excellent record to get this particular award. He worked under Francis Collins, uh, and for those who are following this uh, pandemic, uh, you, some of you might have noticed that uh, Francis Collins uh, gets interviewed by CNN because he's the current director of NIH. So Dan worked with the current director of NIH, who is now, of course, uh, providing support to Dr. Fauci uh, in, uh, in this pandemic. Uh, so Alvin had 
mentioned earlier, Dan had served in the editorial boards of Gene in the International Journal of Biotechnology. He has published many papers, uh, at least 150 papers, and his uh, AIDS index is uh, 35 uh, as uh, you know, I look at it. And uh, he had gotten numerous awards and patents as well. Now, Dan is, uh, was a program director of the means, which is the neurogenetics at the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Prior to his current position, which is now as associate director for special initiatives at the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences at NIH. Uh, this, uh, uh, this center is actually uh, dealing with uh, and is responsible for scientific and programmatic coordination to several trans NIH programs, such as uh, DOD's DARPA. And uh, some of you might know a little bit about DARPA. That is the, the center in the uh, Pentagon that develops a lot of uh, new technologies and uh, then gets involved in coordinating uh, things there with NIH. So, and uh, it's uh, my pleasure and of course, congratulations to Dan for winning or for getting that co-science award. And it's now my pleasure to introduce him to give his talk, which is on developing disruptive technologies through team science. And uh, uh, Dan, uh, you are, uh, you could present your talk now. Let me unshare. Thank you so much, Albert, uh, uh, Edsel. All right. Well, uh, maraming salamat Giselle and Alvin, certainly for organizing uh, this month-long uh, virtual PASI conference and for acting as our virtual host. Uh, thank you, Edsel, for the warm welcome. Uh, good morning to our Kababayans uh, tuning in from the Philippines and a pleasant evening to colleagues and friends in the United States. Uh, it is indeed a great honor to receive the Co Lectureship Award uh, in science. I would like to express uh, my sincere gratitude uh, to Drs. Concepcion, to, to Dr. Pena, Librilla, and, and uh, Harold, uh, who are uh, officers of PASE, and certainly would like to uh, extend my gratitude uh, to the Co-Lectureship Awards Committee, Alvin, Diane, and Seville for selecting me as this year's recipient. I would be very remiss if I did not acknowledge uh, the previous um, award recipients um, uh, in, in, in science and engineering in PASE. Uh, these men and women truly represent uh, the best minds in science, engineering, and PASE. I am truly standing in the shoulder of giants. In particular, I would like to acknowledge uh, the 2008 awardees, uh, Ed uh, Padlan, who actually nominated me many years back for PASI membership, and to Romel Gomez, uh, who actually nominated me for this award. It is indeed a privilege to share this plenary session also uh, with previous award winners, uh, Pedro Jose and uh, Carlito Leprila. In my presentation on developing disruptive technologies through team science, what I hope to convey to you uh, and cover uh, within the next uh, half an hour or so would be uh, to go over the challenges in drug discovery and development, the need for disruptive technologies, such as the microphysiological systems or tissue, chip, tissue chips, uh, using a team science approach uh, to, to partnerships within the NIH Tissue Chips Consortium, and how you build confidence, how you commercialize, uh, leading to adoption of this technology in de development. Uh, and I'd like to end with Ad Astra, uh, which is Latin for aim for the stars. And I hope it will become evident uh, why uh, this is towards the end of my talk. Uh, for those of you who might sneak out for morning coffee or an evening snack, uh, my take home message is this, uh, team science is a key enabler uh, to tackle complex challenges and achieve innovative solutions. Uh, it involves active partnerships with multiple stakeholders, 
and the convergence of expertise in the life sciences uh, with the physical, chemical, mathematical, and computational engineering and social sciences. One of the benefits of being a member of PASA is learning from the very diverse and interdisciplinary group of scientists, engineers, and PASA. And I hope that we can implement team science in tackling the many scientific challenges facing us. Over the last 20 years, it has become very, we have become very adept in making basic science discoveries. Uh, this is especially true soon after the Human Genome Project, where we know more about the nearly uh, 7,000 human diseases that have been discovered, but we are less successful uh, in translating these discoveries into cures and treatments. In fact, there are only about 500 therapies that are available to treat these human conditions. So why, why is therapy, developing therapy so difficult? When we bemoan the cost of prescription drugs or wonder why it takes so long to come up with vaccines and therapies for COVID-19, uh, part of the problem is how drug development has been done for decades. Uh, numerous studies indicate uh, that the average time it takes to develop and bring to market a drug is 10 to 15 years. It also costs on the average uh, about $2.6 billion for every drug that goes to market. So what we're looking at is a current drug discovery paradigm that has a high failure rate of 90%. And this is because the, the 2D cell culture systems, the animal models that we use currently just do not predict the human condition. And so as a consequence of that, 55% of, of developed drugs fail due to lack of efficacy. That means it wasn't shown to be effective in treating the human disease. And then 28% fails because of toxic effects in humans. Uh, what we need are disruptive technologies. Disruptive technologies uh, in drug development, especially, that are more efficient and sustainable uh, over the current paradigm. It is because of these challenges that the United States Congress acted in 2011 uh, to establish the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences. It has its sole mission is to catalyze the generation of innovative methods and technologies that will enhance the development, testing, and implementation of diagnostics and therapeutics across a wide range of human diseases and conditions. Uh, this shows that, that instead of actually getting better, we are, are getting worse in, in developing new drugs. So that's why I put down there, Houston, we have a problem. And it is actually costing us more. Uh, like in, in, 19, in the 1950s, for a billion dollars, you can have close to 100 drugs being developed for a billion dollars. Uh, but as I've mentioned, uh, each drug now that goes to market costs on the average $2.6 billion. So there is clearly a diminishing return on investments. So we have poor translation of basic observations into interventions that can directly improve human health. Uh, intervention development process that we use is failure prone, inefficient and costly. And there is poor or slow adoption of, of uh, useful tools, resources and interventions. So my group at NCATS uh, aims to develop, de demonstrate and disseminate destructive technologies that will change the way we develop treatments and cures. Uh, so these are uh, a list of, of the many uh, programs and in initiatives that we have uh, that my group is working on, and I'll be focusing on this particular uh, topic of microphysiological systems for the rest of my talk this evening or this, or this morning. So what exactly are microphysiological systems? Uh, these are tissues or organoids on microfabricated chips that consist of multi-channel, uh, three-dimensional, microfluidic cell culture platforms that emulates the activities, the mechanics and physiological response of entire organs and organ systems. Uh, what we aim to do is to represent the 10 major organ systems in the body, such as the circulatory, the endocrine, the GI, immune, skin, musculoskeletal system, nervous, reproductive, respiratory, and urinary system. It essentially means uh, reverse engineering biology into these microfabricated chips. To fabricate chips, we need uh, to consider, to take into consideration uh, many things that goes into reverse engineering organ systems into, into tissue chips. 
uh, such as the scaffold, what sort of extracellular matrix will you need, what type of cells and the type of cell mixtures, the structure, uh, perfusion, uh, creating microfluidic channels, the bioreactors or chambers where the cells grow, uh, being able to have uh, innervation and an immune system, as well as some, some built-in uh, uh, readouts, uh, such as uh, microelectronic uh, membranes and, and computational design. To achieve this will require uh, a diverse group of interdisciplinary interdis experts who are willing to work together and come to a viable solution and, and make this workable. As an example, uh, if we are to represent the human lung uh, for, for a, a tissue chip technology, uh, we have to reduce it down to its basic functional unit, which is the alveolus or the air sac, uh, shown here on this left. Uh, this is a rendering of what uh, a lung on a chip would look like. As you can see, there is uh, cyclic vacuuming on each side of the chip that would simulate the negative pressure as we breathe in and out. And so in, consequently, the cells shown here in blue, uh, the lung epithelial cells are actually being stretched as well as the blood cells, the uh, vascular endothelial cells uh, in the bottom. So it mimics the biomechanical properties uh, of the lung. Um, likewise, uh, you can have uh, microvasculature on the chip. Uh, so these are tiny blood vessels. Uh, and so shown here are uh, two micron fluorescent beads, uh, similar to what you see uh, for blood cells uh, coursing to these microfluidic channels. Uh, you can also uh, innervate, uh, in this case, a gut enteroid, uh, so that it actually undergoes peristalsis, similar to what happens to our uh, GI system after just um, uh, a nice uh, breakfast or a nice dinner uh, that we may just have had. Uh, because these devices are, are very small as well, and, and we need to um, be quick in assessing the uh, effects of, of uh, the various drugs, uh, we need to develop real-time biosensing capabilities uh, to tell us what's going on in these chips. Um, so in, in this particular case, uh, being able to tell when the cells are dying uh, due to toxic effects of a particular drug, uh, for example, uh, uh, fluorescent indicators that turns the cells from red to green uh, to indicate cell death. Uh, so those things are also built in into the platform. Uh, so the tissue chips come in many flavors and sizes. And by flavors and sizes, I don't mean uh, barbecue chips or uh, salt and vinegar chips, uh, but these are actually chips, um, uh, actual fabricated chips. Uh, so this will be act the actual lung on a chip. Uh, this is the microvasculature on a chip. This will be the GI system on a chip. And for this particular uh, chip, this is actually the female reproductive system. Uh, as you are probably aware, uh, females are hardly represented in human clinical trials. Uh, and so this is an opportunity to study uh, the effects of, uh, in this particular chip, it contains the, uh, the vagina, it contains this, the ovary, uh, uterus, the fallopian tubes, and coupled with uh, liver uh, to inform how the liver uh, is influenced by female hormonal cycle uh, for its drug metabolism. And lastly, our ultimate goal is, of course, to have a 10 organ uh, chip system as shown in this diagram. For, or predicting to, uh, uh, for predicting toxicity, this is a slide summary uh, showing the many different types of tissue chips that have been developed uh, to examine candidate drugs to see if they have toxic properties. And so we have uh, things like uh, neurons uh, or blood-brain barriers, uh, liver, uh, the GI system. We have uh, human lung, uh, human uh, intestinal organoids, as I've said, the female reproductive system, um, heart and liver, or heart, yeah, heart and liver and, and other organ systems. So these this are um, some of the technologies being used uh, and tissue chips being developed to actually uh, test uh, candidate drugs for toxicity. Uh, just to give you an example uh, on how these are used for predicting toxicity. Um, so I'm showing here 
um, the liver on the chip because our liver is the major organ that metabolizes or breaks down drugs. Most of the drug's toxic effect is manifested in the liver. So in this particular case, uh, Fia Luridin is actually an antiviral agent which was discontinued during phase two human clinical trial uh, due, due, due to liver failure, uh, despite promising preclinical data in rats. Uh, so the preclinical data, which was using animal models, showed that it was safe uh, to use in humans. And so in this retrospective study, we tried to recreate why uh, this uh, human clinical trial failed and what was the reason for, for the failure. So in this particular case, you have uh, rat liver uh, cells on chips, uh, and, and on the bottom are human liver cells, uh, and they were dosed with 1, 10, and 30, a uh, micromolar of fialuridin, as you can see clearly that the rat cells when stained with, with Nile red uh, still consistently shown the same color and it's been quantitated here on this chart. Whereas the human uh, liver on the chip shows increasing amounts in a dose dependent manner, uh, accumulation of, of lipids or fatty deposits uh, leading to steatosis uh, or liver failure. Uh, in this system. And that is quantitated on this chart showing that actually the human liver in a chip would have predicted um, this uh, toxic effect of the drug that the rat uh, animal model or the rat liver on a chip uh, did not predict. And, and having this kind of data would have saved uh, time and effort in developing this drug and certainly would have saved uh, many human lives uh, that would have not died because of uh, knowing what the toxic effect would be. Uh, another way of looking at it is to look at albumin secretion, uh, which is uh, an indicator of liver function. And so you can see here that the rat chip, the rat liver on the chip continues to produce albumin, uh, whereas the human liver on the chip, when dosed, uh, again with, with uh, increasing dose of fialuridin, starts to show decreasing albumin uh, secretion. Uh, likewise, uh, when you look at uh, uh, markers of liver injury, such as uh, a microRNA called MIR-122, which is liver specific in its expression pattern, as well as uh, glutathione S-transferase, a specific liver enzyme, and, and keratin, you can see that this liver injury markers uh, increases in a dose-dependent manner as well, indicating that liver function is compromised and would lead to li liver failure. This next slide shows the importance of having interconnected multiple uh, organ systems. Uh, shown here is the schematic of how you could connect uh, a blood brain barrier, a gut, liver, kidney, uh, with, with the heart and, and other control systems. So in, in this actual study, uh, the liver and kidney uh, were uh, coupled together to study the effect of aristolochic acid um, metabolism uh, leading to uh, kidney failure or, or kidney toxicity. So, if, um, so arisolochic is, is, a, is, a, uh, is a chemical that is found in Chinese herb medicine that is usually taken for weight loss, uh, but unfortunately can lead to kidney failure. So in this particular uh, study, if you just have the kidney on a chip uh, treated with um, uh, zero or five mic or 10 micromolars of erisolochic acid. If it's just the kidney cells, the kidney uh, stays happy and alive. But when you couple it with the liver, uh, the liver, uh, the presence of just the liver uh, would start to break down the erisolochic acid and the met metabolites actually leads to kidney toxicity. And that's shown in this chart. Uh, in order to study what the mechanism is and what that metabolite is, it turns out that it's a sulfated conjugated form of aristolochic acid. And this is shown here in live dead cell staining. So if this is uh, treated uh, without any aristolochic acid, so this is how it looks like when treated with uh, this conjugated form. Uh, this is the dead cell, dead kidney cells. And interestingly, um, this uh, sulfated form is actually taken up by the kidney cells using the uh, um, organic ionic uh, ion transporter uh, four. Uh, so you can actually block the effect or the uptake 
of, of this uh, aristolochic acid metabolite uh, by adding two millimolar of uh, probenicid and showing that you can actually, so the mechanism of action in terms of uptake uh, leading to cell, uh, cell death of the kidney cells. So in addition to the use of, kit, of uh, tissue chips for evaluating drug safety profile, uh, tissue chips are also being developed to, the, to model various diseases, uh, such as in this case, Alzheimer's disease, uh, ALS and Parkinson's disease. Uh, we have neuropsychiatric disorders, uh, radiation-induced serostomia. So this is dry salivary gland because of radiation therapy. Uh, a lot of uh, rare diseases, uh, uh, modeling um, uh, cardiac uh, myopathies, uh, atrial fibrillation, uh, you can have kidney diseases, vascular malformations, um, uh, COPD, and influenza infection in the lung, uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome, and even for complex diseases um, such as type 2 diabetes uh, with multiple um, tissue and organ components. So this uh, uh, models, when validated, will be useful for evaluating candidate drugs uh, to demonstrate its effectiveness or e efficacy uh, in treating these diseases. Uh, so a recent str uh, strategy in drug development is, to, is, re is repurposing. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, you take an FDA approved drug uh, to, um, and then screen them for effectiveness in other indications uh, other than the disease that the drugs were developed for. So in some ways, uh, taking an already approved drug so that you can shorten the time of development because you already have a safety profile of that drug and just seeing if it works uh, for another uh, disease or another indication. So in this case, uh, looking at um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection um, in, in uh, lung epithelial cells. So in this case, uh, just looking at 2D uh, cell cultures on a dish or in a petri plate, uh, you can see um, here, uh, shown in, in the black uh, bar graph, uh, cells that were infected with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, shown in gray are cells infected with a control virus just to show that the effect is not specific to the um, particular um, uh, way that the cells were treated and, and, and would control for non-specific effects. So you can see here, uh, that of the seven drugs that were uh, tested uh, in a 2D cell culture system, for the most part at increasing a dose up to five micromolar, they show quite a dramatic uh, effect in decreasing viral entry. So that means, you know, it might be promising as a preventative to, to prevent the infection of the lung cells uh, against SARS-CoV-2. Uh, but if so if you were to pursue this uh, study, you would have to test all the seven candidate drugs, go through the additional follow-up screens. And of course that takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, but the value of, of uh, this three-dimensional uh, human airway on the chips is that now we can actually see if, if these are actually viable candidates to pursue. So the same treatment was done um, at five micromolars. And you can see here with, with the lung on a chip, it's only uh, uh, torimethin and amodiaquine uh, that shows promise in preventing SARS-CoV-2 viral entry. Uh, torimethin is a non-steroidal estrogen receptor uh, antagonist, which could explain to why uh, men are actually more prone to uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection. And then amodiaquine is actually an anti-malarial alternative to chloroquine. So you would note here that chloroquine, while it showed uh, a uh, dramatic increase or decrease in viral entry in a 2D cell culture system actually did not have much effect on the actual uh, 2D cell culture system. And so this is, this is how uh, this system can be used uh, for testing the uh, potential efficacy or effectiveness of a candidate drug. Now in switching gears and looking at the economics of science, uh, investors usually turn to market indicators, uh, for example, the, the Gartner plot uh, for promising technologies. Uh, new, new technologies, as shown here, actually go through five stages uh, of development. One is the innovation trigger, where uh, uh, you know, certainly the proof of concept or perhaps even a prototype is demonstrated to show some utility 
And then of course that leads to a lot of excitement and publicity uh, leading to a peak of uh, inflated expectation. Now, if those uh, inflated expectations are not managed properly, that almost always leads to failures, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, exposure of the deficiencies in the technologies. Uh, and that leads to a number of companies or, or developers actually bailing out or going out of business. Um, and, and then those that survive may produce second, third, uh, even fourth generation um, follow on technologies uh, with improved SOPs uh, that would then ev eventually lead to um, high growth uh, adoption and uh, at least a 30% uh, market share. Uh, so when we started tissue chips or bi the biochips actually was marked here in 2013 down in the bottom uh, and in 2018, we're, we're right now at the peak of inflated in fact, uh, uh, expectation. My goal is to reach the plateau of productivity in a short time as possible. And so the question is, how do you uh, achieve that? What, you know, what are the, some of the strategies needed uh, to go about doing that? And so what uh, uh, I have come up with in, in, in doing the market survey and talking to uh, the, the scientists and, and the technology experts, uh, it's clear that the new technology must meet market needs. Uh, there should be early engagement with, uh, with the end users. And then of course the technology should demonstrate ease of use and cost efficiency. And so the uh, question is how do you go about doing that? So in, in the tissue chip program, uh, we have several strategies uh, that we have established uh, or developed to uh, bring um, this quickly into, into adoption. So first strategy number one is uh, we establish a validation framework for tissue chips to build confidence in the technology. Uh, what does that mean? So it, it's actually three stages of validation. Uh, one is physiological. Uh, does the technology itself or the organ and chip actually represent organ function and structure? Uh, and this can be demonstrated with a training set of reference compounds where you know what the effects are uh, based on humans and can these chips actually replicate uh, the findings on the reference compounds. So largely this is done by the tissue chip developers themselves. And in fact, we have done this and demonstrated this in a number of publications. Um, so as of 2007, uh, about 500, more than 500 publications have resulted from this type of work and this type of validation. The second stage of validation is called the analytical stage. Uh, and this is typically done by an independent group of scientists uh, testing for robustness, reproducibility, reliability, and relevance. And, and this is typically done with a validation set of compounds, biomarkers, and assays. In order to achieve this, uh, NCATS established uh, tissue chip testing centers. Um, and, um, and so in this case, we funded uh, MIT and Texas A&M University to be the independent testing centers. And we also created an, uh, a microphysiological systems database uh, housed at University of Pittsburgh. And finally, the last stage uh, in terms of the validation framework uh, would be industrial. And this is actually where industry, uh, the pharma industry and regulatory agencies such as the FDA uh, starts taking an interest and starts using them uh, in-house uh, in terms of drug development. And, and of course, this is done now with proprietary set of compounds and can perhaps done with uh, a CRO contract research organization type environment. And to achieve this, um, NCATS uh, encourage uh, these testing centers to actually develop a, a sustainable um, revenue generating business model. And so in that regard, MIT actually uh, morphed or, and evolved into Javelin Biotech, which is now operating as a CRO uh, business model. And then Texas A&M uh, evolved into a, a tissue chip testing consortium, which is essentially a, a play for pay, a model with academia, government and industry partners. And so using this strategy, uh, we are hoping that it would lead a path to commercialization and adoption. Uh, but of course, one, one thing that we're also pursuing is establishment of a microphysiological system or tissue chips international scientific conference and professional society starting in 2021. Now, strategy number two uh, means identifying and partnering with key stakeholders right from the very beginning 
not only uh, for the additional investments, but also for guidance uh, and exchange of information. So this just shows how the program actually involved through the uh, eight years or so uh, since NCAT started in, in 2000, well, the program actually started in 2012. Uh, so we, we've uh, shown the kind of investments that we put in. So about uh, altogether about $340 million uh, investment through, through that eight years or so uh, coming in uh, from the NIH and NCATS. And, and likewise, we have identified the key stakeholders to engage early uh, not only DARPA, but also the FDA, uh, which has been a, a key partner from the start, giving us guidance in terms of how these devices can be um, approved uh, for regulatory use. Uh, so they don't provide any funding, but certainly are key uh, um, uh, partners for, for guidance. Uh, and then of course, lastly, the, the uh, end users, uh, meaning the pharmaceutical industry, uh, representing here by the IQ consortium, uh, and so currently we have uh, interest uh, coming in from 24 pharmaceutical major, you know, worldwide pharmaceutical companies uh, who've expressed an interest in, in um, uh, applying tissue chip technology in, in terms of drug development. Strategy number three is being prepared to take on additional partners as interest grows and as potential opportunities come about. So even within partnership within the NIH has grown. Uh, as shown here and different applications of tissue chips uh, from cancer biomimetics, uh, I've said to modeling diabetes, to creating immune system and chips, uh, nervous system uh, disorders, uh, blood brain barriers, biomimetics for infectious diseases. Uh, we've also um, partnered with other agencies, government agencies and funding partners, uh, such as BARDA, the CDC, TRISH, um, NASA Human Research Program, the EPA, uh, United States Geological Survey and, and the Veterans Administration, and, and certainly have been instrumental in uh, catalyzing uh, the development of technologies, uh, this type of technology in Europe, Asia, and in Australia. Strategy number four is encouraging and funding a number of spin off and startup companies. These are just about 20 or so uh, companies that have already uh, started and formed around organ on chips. And, and organoid on chips and tissue chip technology. So NIH has uh, certainly supported the development of spin-off and startup companies. And this certainly leads to democratization of the technology platforms, uh, allowing pharmaceutical companies and other end users to choose uh, from at least 20 companies for CRO-like services and or purchase of various platforms and accompanying consumables. And finally, uh, we, we go to Ad Astra, uh, sort of like the cliffhanger, uh, aim for the stars. Uh, so Ad Astra, as I mentioned, is Latin, uh, which aim, uh, means aim for the stars. Ad Astra is an admonition uh, that my parents gave uh, their children and grandchildren. Uh, on the left is a picture of them when they uh, just got married and the other was taken in their 40th anniversary. Uh, sadly, they are no longer with us. Uh, but I do dedicate this presentation to them uh, since they encourage me to always think outside the box. Um, and so what does outside of the box thinking mean in this uh, Ad Astra strategy? Well, um, I think that uh, it's really uh, looking at uh, age-related physiological changes. Um, uh, this is a hard system to model. Uh, we all age. Uh, just as my parents did, and we will all experience these age-related changes. That includes musculoskeletal uh, changes uh, such as osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, sarcopenia. Uh, we, have, we can have GI changes, cardiovascular changes, uh, where the heart valves tend to increase in thickness with age, blood pressure tends to go up with age, and you get osteoporosis and arteriosclerosis, uh, respiratory changes, uh, renal deficiencies, uh, decline in immune response, uh, and certainly decline in visual acuity or hearing and overall sensory decline. So the question then is, can we model age-related diseases on tissue chips? And can we develop drugs uh, to mitigate or slow down age-related diseases? And who are, of course, the right partners to engage? Um, and so as it turns out, uh, similar age-related, aging-related changes happens to astronauts um, even after only a brief exposure to microgravity. 
Um, and so for, our, for the, uh, you know, 800 or so astronauts that have actually gone up in space and spent a considerable amount of time, uh, either at the space station, the space shuttle, um, you know, there are some of the uh, early changes that happen. So within, er early, within three weeks, the early response includes upper body fluid shift, uh, neurovestibular disturbances, sleep disturbances, bone demineralization. Uh, uh, within three to six months, uh, in addition to above, you have muscle atrophy, cardiovascular deconditioning, GI disturbances, hematological changes, and any uh, astronaut staying for more than six months uh, actually suffer uh, much more severe uh, uh, changes such as declining immunity and renal stone formation. But the major difference uh, between the actual aging that happens on Earth and space-related changes is that when the astronauts return back to Earth, everything reverts back to normal. And so here presents itself an opportunity for us to investigate the biology of aging uh, during which we can study its development, but also uh, during the recovery, and perhaps identify what the, those molecular changes are, what those epigenetic changes are, uh, and develop drugs that may slow down uh, the effects of aging uh, uh, for each and everyone here. And so how do we uh, do this? And so again, uh, you know, I, I consider the ad astra sort of like identifying what the game changers are. So game changer number one, uh, uh, so what we did was MCATS partnered with NASA uh, the, and CASES, uh, which is the Center for the Advancement of Science in Space and the International Space Station at National Laboratory for the Tissue Chips and Space Program, which is essentially to study the role of the environment that is microgravity and human health and disease and to translate those understanding to improve human health on Earth. And so what we have done here is to look at uh, the effects of, of aging on the human body and trying to replicate those on the chips. Uh, the second game changer number two is the automation and miniaturization required uh, for space, space flight. And that would essentially lead uh, to broader adoption and use of tissue chips te uh, technology here on Earth. And let me, let me illustrate uh, how this works. And so if we're, for game changer number one is actually our official space patch that would fly on missions and the various projects that we're pursuing, looking at immunosenescence, the study of uh, aging of the immune system, uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis, um, uh, blood brain barrier permeability changes, uh, immune system and lung infection, looking at the formation of uh, kidney stone and proteinuria in the kidney, uh, some of the cardiac changes and muscle wasting such as sarco sarcopenia and the uh, tendency to have gut inflammation and the change in microbiome. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, game changer number two is, is looking at technological improvements. And the control systems for tissue chips are actually very complex and, and, and uh, quite complicated. And just to illustrate that, so this is a, sort of like the typical setup in the laboratory uh, to run 24 chips. Um, and so I wouldn't go to all the specifications down here, but just to give, to drive home the point, it's about 48 cubic feet or 1.4 cubic meters. So it's about the size of an average fridge. Uh, but as you may know, um, payload is quite uh, a expensive realty in space. And so the demands uh, uh, for this project to go up in space and still maintain uh, the same functionality as it is on earth is that we have to reduce this fridge size technology or fridge size instrumentation uh, to the size of a shoebox. So how do you go about doing that? So again, we partner with NASA, CASES, and International Space Station, and their space implementation partners, TechShot, uh, Space Tango, and Bioserve, and, and work with the NASA engineers and payload developers uh, towards automation and miniaturization. In just a little over a year since the tissue chips uh, project started in 2017, uh, we were actually quite successful uh, in, in uh, miniaturizing the technology and sending chips up in space. So in fact, uh, this is a picture that I took uh, watching the launch for uh, SpaceX 16 at the Kennedy Space Center and included in the payload is our immune senescence on chip project. Uh, and then in uh, April of 2019, SpaceX 17 launched, uh, and that included uh, four projects, the lung infection in bone marrow, proteinuria and kidney stone formation, um, osteoarthritis and blood-brain barrier permeability, 
Um, and then SpaceX 20 launch just before uh, uh, COVID-19 uh, lockdown uh, at the Kennedy Space Center. Again, uh, this payload included uh, uh, looking at the aging effects in heart tissues and the immune response in the intestine. So this were, uh, the last two were night launches. And just to give you a picture, this is the picture uh, taken of a night launch, uh, equally spectacular as a day launch. Uh, and so in such a short period of time, uh, we were able to model aging related disease. Uh, so shown here is actually the Dragon capsule being captured by the space station. And, and this is one of the astronauts, Christina Cox, uh, working on, on the tissue chips. Um, and so they spent on the average about 30 days uh, up in the space station. Um, and then they returned to Earth, uh, as we saw uh, return of the Dragon uh, capsule yesterday. Uh, and so the sam samples are retrieved and they're analyzed um, biologically for omics marker analysis, such as transcriptomics, uh, metabolomics, epigenetic changes, some histology, immunohistochemistry. And then of course, the instrumentation and the platform uh, are examined for technological um, uh, advances, looking for structural soundness of the chips, uh, platform and instrumentation and experimental automation. Um, what we are planning is that uh, a second flight for all these projects is planned uh, with the testing of actually candidate therapeutics uh, on those second flight to see if we can actually slow down or mitigate the effects that are seen. So, so far our preliminary data shows evidence of aging like physiological changes just within 30 days in space. Uh, so this is compared to current models of aging where it takes months, if not decades, uh, to model aging uh, in other model systems. And so in closing, um, what I'd like to, to uh, again, drive home the point um, that team science is a key enabler uh, to tackle complex challenges and achieve innovative solutions and that involves partnerships with stakeholders and the convergence of interdisciplinary expertise, uh, as I've shown uh, in this presentation. Uh, so far, uh, tissue chips have touched many areas of drug development, uh, as shown in green. And we still have to uh, impact uh, some of the clinical aspects, but we're on our way to doing that with our uh, new program and clinical trials on chips. Uh, it's been estimated in, in 2019 uh, that R&D spending uh, for pharma will grow to $224 billion uh, by 2024. Uh, and likewise, uh, a group of industry uh, pharmaceutical experts uh, predicts that tissue chips would save between 10 and 26% of drug development costs uh, within five years. And so I, you know, not only uh, are we able to uh, hopefully be efficient in drug development, uh, that, and, and uh, make it more economical, but uh, and more importantly, uh, we hope to increase the number of therapies available to treat human diseases. And so with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I certainly am grateful for the many partners uh, that we have in this effort, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for a very, very interesting uh, talk. And uh, uh, we could see the complexity of how science is uh, done uh, in this team science in this complicated world. And uh, just as an observation, you certainly have reached your, your stars that uh, Moto Ad Astra is very fitting for your talk and congratulations. Uh, so, so I think I'm going to allow Al Sirafika to ask a question. Uh, we'll have maybe one or two questions before going to the next uh, speaker. Al, you could turn on your microphone and then you could ask your question. Well, so here, one of the questions that, uh, so I think it's on now. I'll... Okay, Dan. You could ask your question. Yeah. Is it on the chat box? Should I yeah. just read it on the chat box? No, you, you, could, uh, you, could, uh, you could ask. Yeah, it. Dan, yeah. Dan, I mean, congratulations. Excellent. I listened to your talk on 2016. You've gone <laughs> space-wise <laughs> in terms of leaps and bounds. Uh, Thank you. My question is on the spin-offs that you spoke about. Yes. Yeah, on the chat box, I did ask about the 20 spin-offs. How many of them received SBIR? 
I did get an Ashby IR from NIH in 97. So I'm, uh, I'm curious how many of them uh, on the spin-offs from NCATS have uh, I gotten actually, that kind I of support. Have, and I actually what kind of arrangements do you normally give out to the spin-offs? Uh, I actually don't have the numbers on, at the tip of my fingers, but I, I'd say we've sustained and supported probably about anywhere from a third to about 50% uh, of them. A number of these companies are actually foreign based. Um, they, they started uh, forming companies in Europe. And, and of course, as you know, with SBIR, SDTR rules, uh, that only goes to US based companies. So a number of companies have actually, I've known, at least I'm aware of. Uh, two or three companies based in Europe that have actually uh, started operations in the U.S. so they can get SBIR, SCTR grants from the United States. And so they, they uh, range anywhere from phase one, phase two uh, support, okay. anywhere from a, a typical 175 to 1. You know, $1.7 uh, million so like uh, mm -hmm. yeah. for, for uh, uh, a phase two uh, award. Uh, and most of them are actually now commercializing uh, these chips, not only the platforms themselves okay. and the cells, but also uh, offering a fee for service um, as, as part of their uh, business model. Okay. And last question: Have you done anything? Have you done anything for Asia so far? Uh, I've certainly traveled extensively to Japan, to China, uh, Singapore, uh, Korea. Um, I'd say, um, and, and primarily because they had invited me to uh, find out about the program and how they could start similar programs uh, within those countries. So, so, so far Japan uh, with AMED have been successful in launching their, their tissue chip program about two years ago. Uh, they have, they're in the process of developing four tissue chips um, and, and China likewise is, is following closely at the heels of of Japan, uh, Korea is still uh, in the process of developing uh, this technology. Uh, so certainly uh, within uh, countries other than the United States, I'd say Europe is probably um, uh, close uh, uh, to the technology uh, as the US is. Okay, one, one more question and uh, this is from Lisa Birata. Uh, she's thank wondering you. if- uh, Hi Lisa. Thank you, Hal. Yeah, she is. she's wondering if there are any drugs that had been approved by the FDA based on data using these tissue chips. Not yet. That's that's okay. actually my 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 dream and hope is that we actually uh, take a particular drug uh, and 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 test it on chips and take it all the way uh, to IND submissions uh, just based on pure chip data. Uh, mm -hmm. What so far has been going on is that the chip data are being used, uh, supplemental data to the conventional or to traditional way of, of preclinical development. And that is because the FDA, uh, I know Lisa works for the FDA, uh, is primarily uh, requiring companies uh, to have certain uh, guidance in terms of how to develop preclinical data. Uh, and they require two animal species and and so that is still a requirement. Uh, although recently, uh, the FDA have, have actually um, started paying attention to this technology and have now formed what's called uh, an alternatives methods working group within the FDA to start looking uh, at this technology and how it could be implemented in drug development. So I, okay. I'm hoping that soon that will happen. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, uh, Gisela has a question, I think, and then uh, we'll proceed to the next speaker. Gisela? Congratulations, uh, congratulations, Dan, for your out-of-a-box, out-of-this-world space research. And Thank I'd you, like to ask uh, in particular about your um, uh, respiratory model for SARS-CoV-2 um, infection. How, at what stage uh, of infection was it? Early stage? Uh, middle or um, late severe stage. Secondly, in relation to the controversial hydroxychloroquine, did you test it with and without zinc? Thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good question, Giselle, thank you. Uh, so for the first question, um, the, the uh, testing was done on, on early stage of infection. So what we're trying to do is actually looking and screening for drugs 
uh, that would prevent viral entry. So in some ways, uh, 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 preventative uh, in, in some ways or, or uh, mitigating uh, the disease from getting worse. Uh, so early stage of infection. Uh, in terms of the second uh, question, you know, how we tried hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin uh, or zinc, uh, that is work that is still ongoing. Um, uh, right now in, in terms of testing. And, and as you know, uh, since the original description of this being purely respiratory uh, back in March, uh, the number of uh, pathologies uh, has actually gr uh, grown and increased, doesn't just affect the lungs, it affects the kidney, it affects the heart, affects the brain, uh, and more especially the blood vessels uh, ca causing embolism. So all of those are now active areas of investigation using these chips. Okay, one final question, and uh, Joel promises that it's a short one. Joel? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, Dan, congratulations, excellent talk. Uh, you, you referred Joel. to uh, confidence uh, building for the adoption of this technology of uh, organoids or tissue or cell on a chip. And I was kind of thinking that uh, perhaps one way to foster that and also to ensure the efficacy of the chip uh, for the test of the drugs is standardization, particularly of the organoids, uh, defining it as a kind of a functional uh, physiological unit for any particular organ. I was wondering whether your center has uh, thought about uh, uh, doing that or implementing that or coordinating that with the stakeholders, coming up with standards for uh, these organoids. Yeah, so that, that's a very excellent point, Joel, and you're certainly right on the mark. Uh, since this involves uh, many dis disciplines, um, as it turned out, working with uh, engineers and on, on one side, the physical scientists, and on the other side, the biologists or the life sciences, uh, it turns out that, of course, as you know, as, as you would predict, the, the engineering aspects of things, you can engineer, microfabricate uh, endlessly and, and come up precisely with, with what you want. Uh, but life or the life sciences is complicated, especially the biology. Uh, we have to consider uh, diversity, we have to consider gender, we have to consider uh, culture conditions, the sources uh, of, the, of the cells. And so all of those are now uh, certainly undergoing standardization. Do you use primary cells, uh, which is taken directly from, from patients, or do you use uh, stem cells? Uh, when you use stem cells, do you differentiate them in a particular way? So not only uh, the, this, the sampling, the extraction, and the differentiation, all of those have to be standardized. Uh, but that, that is in some ways, uh, 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 it's an area that goes just beyond this, this field of tissue chip technology. That is a common uh, pervasive problem within the area of, of stem cell biology, cell biology, uh, and, and biorepositories. So we're, we're trying to make an impact uh, uh, as it relates to tissue chip technology, but it, it's you hit upon uh, a pervasive uh, problem uh, in, in biology. Okay, so uh, thank you, Dan, and uh, thank you for an excellent presentation, very informative. And, thank you, uh, uh, and of course, people could still ask questions uh, later on the final question and answer, and they could ask uh, Dan some questions. Uh, so let me introduce the our next speaker now. And uh, let me share my little slides here. Uh, could you see, could you see? Could you see the slide that I have? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so her next speaker is uh, Dr. Pedro Jose from George Washington University. And uh, I think I have to do this. Uh, and, uh, Okay. And there is his picture, uh, still a very handsome man for a 78 years old uh, gentleman. So uh, Dr. Jose got his MD degree from the University of Santo Tomas. Uh, I did not get when, but uh, some time ago. And uh, he has the honor of placing first in the Philippine National Board examinations in medicine and surgery. Uh, and then he got his uh, PhD degree in physiology at Georgetown University. And uh, uh, one of the distinctions is that uh, he defended his dissertation with high distinction. Uh, 
Dr. Jose, his current position is as professor of medicine in pharmacology and physiology at the George Washington University. That's a, that's a university close by in the White House. Uh, he has been a visiting professor in several universities in China. He has guest lectured in many universities or all around the world. And uh, he was also the Paasi 2005 co-awardee in science, uh, just like done today, he's a co-awardee for that. Uh, he's the past president of the American Society of Pediatric Nephrology, uh, published a lot of papers, uh, at least 380 papers, and has a very high, high age index of 57. Now in 2018, Dr. Jose got one of the highest awards that the president of the Philippines uh, uh, gave. And this is the Pamana ng Pilipino uh, Presidential Award for Filipino Individuals in Organizations Overseas. And uh, there is the president of the Republic uh, uh, putting the ribbon and the medal on Dr. Jose. And uh, this is uh, uh, for exemplifying the talent in industry of the Filipino he brought the country honor in this recognition through excellence and distinction in the course of their, high, their work or profession. So this is a very high honor for Dr. Said. We are very proud of him. And uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him, to give his thought. It will be on gastrorenal communication, its role in hypertension. Uh, Pedro, so uh, let me unshare here. Okay, go ahead. Pedro, you are muted. Unmute yourself. Mute. Yeah, yeah, click on that. Click on that red microphone. Unmute. you. There. There, there. Okay, thank you very much. Go Can ahead. you hear sure, the slides? The slides are there? The slides are here, yes. Thank okay. you. Okay, that's what yes. I was worried about. Yes. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. And I thank your invitation. I'm going to be talking about gastrorenal communication role in hypertension. In order for zero sodium balance to occur, the amount of sodium that is ingested must equal the amount of sodium that's excreted, mainly in the urine. When the excess sodium that is ingested is not excreted by the kidney, and the excess sodium retained in the body is not buffered in the, in the interstitial space and lymph, blood pressure increases. We nephrologists believe that the kidney is the most important organ of the body, especially in the regulation of blood pressure. And that is according to Homer Smith, the father of modern nephrology, who wrote a book called From Fish to Philosopher. And he said that our kidneys enabled us to evolve. In the beginning, the ocean was isotonic, nutrition diffused in and waste diffused out and diffused back in. As the salinity of the oceans increased, a distal tubule formed to eliminate sodium and waste products of metabolism. Driven by wanderlust, we migrated to fresh water. The environment changed from hypertonic to hypotonic state. We needed to get rid of the water. Therefore, we developed glomeruli to eliminate water, but sodium from the filtered water had to be reabsorbed, so proximal tubules appeared. When we migrated to land, the problem changed from overhydration to dehydration. Therefore, we developed a thick skin and decreased our glomerular filtration rate to save water. However, the decreased filtration rate decreased our ability to extract waste products. And so we decreased our metabolism. But the low metabolism impaired our ability to react quickly. One who is slow cannot rule the earth. We increased our metabolism, but the waste products had to be eliminated. 
Therefore, high glomerular filtration rate returned to prevent excessive excretion of salt and water. We developed the loop of Hindley. The apes became humans and we ruled and continue to rule the earth. Homer Smith said, bones can break, muscles can atrophy, glands can loaf. Even the brain can go to sleep without immediate danger to survival. But should the kidneys fail, neither bones, muscles, glands, nor brain or life itself could carry on. Oops, uh, that was before dialysis and transplantation. So what organ regulates blood pressure? Cheryl Holmes said, too many suspects. Narrow them down, Mr. Watson. The problem is in the kidney. How does one prove that the kidney regulates blood pressure? Shown here is the kidney and a functional unit of the kidney is called a nephron. We have about a million nephrons per kidney. There are three ways, surgical transplantation, combined surgical and molecular biological manipulation, molecular biological methods, for example, renal selective modification of gene of interest. First, we talk about surgical transplantation. Blood pressure in six Americans, African Americans with malignant hypertension was normalized after renal transplantation. And this was reported 37 years ago. Hypertension developed in the recipient of a kidney from a hypertensive donor, but without a family history of hypertension. Transplantation of kidneys from normotensive rats to nephrectomized spontaneously hypertensive rats or SHR prevents the increase in blood pressure while the converse increases blood pressure. And cross renal transplantation in dull salt sensitive rats to dull salt resistant rats and vice versa causes salt sensitive or salt resistant hypertension. The blood pressure is not in hypertensive strains is not normalized with transplanted kidneys from normotensive strains. This indicates the importance of extra renal mechanisms in the regulation of blood pressure. The next method is combined surgical and molecular biological manipulation. How can one determine the, effect, the importance of the kidney in the regulation of blood pressure? And one is by, by studying the effect on blood pressure of cross renal transplantation in a knockout mouse mice in knockout mice with hypertension and their wild type counterparts. Transplanting one knockout kidney to a wild type body with no kidneys and transplanting one wild type kidney into a knockout body with no kidneys. This is the recipient mouse. We get rid of both kidneys of the recipient mouse and then we transplant one kidney to the recipient mouse. And these studies were done by Dr. Lara Siko in the laboratory. And there will be four groups you see in here, donor kidney transplanted to, that is wild type, that is transplanted to a wild type recipient body, a wild type donor kidney transplanted to a knockout recipient body, a knockout donor kidney transplanted to a wild type recipient body and knockout donor kidney transplanted to a knockout body. We reported that the lesion of the dopamine 5 receptor gene increases systolic blood pressure in mice. Here's the systolic blood pressure and these are the wild type mice and the blood pressure of the D5 receptor knockout mice minus minus is elevated and these are unmanipulated mice. Now we now transplant wild type to wild type and knock out to knock out. And you can see in here that the blood pressures of the wild type to wild type transplants have the same, are the same as those of the wild types that are unmanipulated. And so are the mice with the knock out to knock out have blood pressures that are elevated similar to the unmanipulated dopamine 5 receptor knockout mice. Now transplantation of a knockout kidney into a wild type body increases systolic blood pressure. 
and transplantation of a wild type kidney into a knockout body decreases systolic blood pressure. Renal cross transplantation experiments indicate that blood pressure regulation is 80% renal and 20% extrarenal. The third method is molecular biological method that is renal selective modification of gene of interest. So here you can manipulate the gene of interest in the renal cortex by the renal subcapsular infusion of siRNA or silencing RNA. Or you can also do retrograde ureteral infusion of agents to manipulate the gene of interest in the renal tubules only. Silence or knock out, knock in the gene of interest in nephron segments. You can see here that adeno associated virus mediated renal gene transfer by retrograde infusion via the ureter. These are in vivo bioluminescence images. Not, uh, we retrogradely infused only into the left kidney and so here in the ventral position and dorsal position. Here the adeno associated viral mediated renal gene transfer by retrograde infusion via the ureter and immune staining for the detection of the fluorescent GFP in the mouse kidney. And you can see here that we can have the distal tubule and you can hear that we can see the proximal tubule of the kidney. Ingested sodium by the stomach or gut is one mechanism by which sodium balance is regulated. After ingesting too much salt, the stomach begs the kidney, please rectify my dietary indiscretion. And we call this the gastrorenal axis. Several gut hormones have been proposed to mediate the natriuresis or increase in sodium excretion following an oral sodium load. And these enterokines or GI hormones or gut hormones. The examples are uroguanilin in here, cholecystokinin or CCK and gastrin. And these hormones increase sodium excretion. Gastrin is secreted by G cells in the antrum of the stomach, duodenum and pancreas. It stimulates secretion of gastric acid by the parietal cells of the stomach and aids in gastric motility. Circulating gastrin levels are 10 to 20 fold higher than cholecystokinin or CCK levels. Circulating CCK, proguanilin, prouroguanilin, and uroguanilin levels are not increased following ingestion of sodium chloride. By contrast, an increase in sodium intake increases circulating gastrin levels. Of all the gut hormones, gastrin is the one that's taken up to the greatest extent by renal proximal tubules. By secreting gut hormones like gastrin in response to ingested sodium, the stomach directs the kidney to increase sodium excretion. A certain amount of sodium in food increases serum gastrin levels. This is 30 minutes post ingestion in anesthetized salt resistant bulb sea mice. You can see here serum gastrin level, basal state, very little sodium, nothing happens. But when one increases, the amount of sodium in the food, you can see in here that serum gastrin levels increase. Now, sodium independent of food can increase serum gastrin levels, again in bulb sea mice. Here, distilled water only, a little bit of sodium only, and a little bit more of sodium. And you can see in here the increase in serum gastrin levels. The presence of food, however, increases the ability of sodium to increase serum gastrin levels in bulb sea mice. You can see in here, sodium only, but when one adds food, you can see the marked increase in sodium gastrin levels and a little bit more if the sodium concentration is increased in the stomach with or without food. How can we be sure that the sodium mediated increase in serum gastrin level is not caused by neural mechanisms? So what we did is to determine the effect of sodium and food introduced to the stomach ex vivo. See here is the ex vivo stomach in which the esophagus in here is ligated with a tube going into the stomach and the pylorus is ligated, as you can see here. 
the expression of gastrin is increased in mouse stomach exposed to sodium chloride. Now, sodium is mainly responsible for the increase in gastrin expression in mouse stomach exposed to sodium chloride ex vivo. You can see here sodium chloride. We get rid of the chloride, but sodium is still there. And you hear, you see, can see here that sodium gluconate increases gastrin expression just as efficiently as sodium chloride. When one gets rid of both sodium and chloride and use mannitol instead, again, same osmolarity, very, almost nothing appears. And then when one gets rid of sodium and chloride still there, gastrin expression is also not increased. Now, Gastrin and annexin-4 in human G cells in here, shown in here, this is gastrin in red, is annexin-4. in four. And the reason I'm showing you this is because annexin is important in the exocytosis of proteins. This is the plasma membrane. Here you have gastrin and annexin. You have the yellow in here, red and green. And then when one merges all of this, gastrin, annexin, and plasma membrane, you can see in here the white that's the gastrin undergoing exocytosis. We next study the effect of blood pressure in the germline deletion of gastrin in salt-resistant bulbsy mice. Here's the expression of gastrin in wild-type mice, plus, plus, see there, and very little, if any, in the gastrin knockout mice. You can see in here that the blood pressure of gastrin wild-type mice is not affected by a decrease in sodium intake, or an increase in sodium intake. However, in the gastrin knockout mice, these gastrin knockout mice have high blood pressure and the blood pressure is decreased by a low salt diet and increased again by a high salt diet. Noticing here that the normal sodium blood pressure is actually the same as that in the high sodium diet. So that if one only does an experiment in which one tests only the effect of normal sodium and high sodium in blood pressure, then the erroneous conclusion would be that that mouse or animal or human, if you can do that, is not salt sensitive. What causes the increase in blood pressure in gastrin knockout mice? Well, you can see here that the natriuretic response, this fractional sodium excretion here, then oral sodium load is impaired in gastrin knockout mice, the open bars. And there are several sodium transporters in the kidney and the renal sodium hydrogen exchanger type three or NHE3, sodium potassium two chloride co-transporter NKCC2 and epithelial sodium channel ENAX in here and sodium potassium ATPase expressions are increased in the gastrin knockout mice. However, the interpretation of the effects of germline deletion of the gene of interest is confounded by compensatory mechanisms during development unless the gene deletion is inducible. To determine the role of gastrin released by the stomach and duodenum and sodium excretion after a meal with sodium, we devise a method to silence gastrin secretion by infusing gastrin siRNA into the celiac artery. This method also provides direct proof that the stomach communicates with the kidney or any organ of interest. Here is the mouse stomach in here. Here is the aorta. Here is the celiac artery. And we put in a catheter in here, celiac artery, and kind of thread it close to the gastroduodenal artery. Here's the expression of gastrin in the mucosa of bulbs in mouse infused with MAC siRNA. Gastrin still there, but almost completely gone with the silencing siRNA. Now, as it turns out, gastrin mRNA or gastrin is also expressed in other organs besides the stomach. You can see in here, renal medulla has a little bit, renal cortex has a lot, and adrenal medulla, and of course the stomach should have a lot of gastrin. So we then infused the gastrin siRNA into gastrodidinal artery, and it decreases, see here, gastrin mRNA, but not in the kidney, which means that 
the infusion is selective to the stomach. Systolic blood pressure under anesthesia is increased in CCKBR mice. Cholecystokinin receptor is the receptor of gastrin. You can see in here the increased systolic blood pressure. Systolic blood pressure under anesthesia is also increased in these mice, wild type mice treated with a CCKBR antagonist. And you can see here that systolic blood pressure is also increased in the gastrin wild type mouse treated with the gastrin siRNA infused into the gastrodenal artery. And the natriuretic, natriuretic response or FENA to an oral sodium load is impaired in gastrin knockout mice and the gastrin siRNA treated gastrin wild type mice. There is a problem. Gastrin is important. It We lost you, Andrew. He might have trouble with his internet connection. Yeah, it, uh, it looks like he's frozen. Uh, Mo Rich Mon? Yes, sir. Uh, what do we do here? Um, do we like to, put the presentation to the other presenter, po, sir? Or, and we'll just go back to Sir Parlo when he's uh, okay with this internet. Uh -huh. Let's wait one minute. He might be reconnecting. He did say there was a storm passing by, so I'm wondering. Yeah, so maybe it's in a uh, the Virginia area now, you know? So, although I think it was uh, passing by in South Carolina uh, at this moment uh, in Charleston. Can somebody call uh, Pedro, uh, Lea? Dan, do you have his number, cell phone number? You may not be aware uh, that he cannot be heard. Yeah, he, he disconnected. Uh, so, so um, maybe somebody can call him or text him. But uh, I think uh, many of us know that there are uh, storms uh, in the east coast of the United States. Yes. Yeah, so uh, the other possibility is we could uh, have Carlito present his talk. And then if uh, Pedro comes back, then uh, he could finish it after Carlita. Okay, we'll wait for another two minutes and then uh, uh -huh. and yeah. Carlito. Me... Yes. Yeah, it's very possible that the storm is uh, messing up his uh, connection somehow. So Carlito, I think we have to proceed with yours and then uh, uh, we could have uh, Pedro continue his talk after your talk. Okay. So, uh, yep, is that okay? Right. And yep, uh, I, could, I could introduce you at this point. Okay, so uh, sorry we lost an entertaining talk there from Pedro and uh, we learned a lot about uh, blood pressure somehow and uh, not eating too much salt. That's what my doctor is saying. But uh, We'll go to Carlito's talk and uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Lebrele. Uh, 
So some highlights from uh, uh, Dr. Lebrella's uh, very, very uh, long record. Uh, he got his uh, P BS in chemistry as well as his, uh, uh, from Irvine, UC Irvine, and then his PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. So I noticed that Carlito is a real Californian. Uh, after his PhD, he got uh, his postdoctoral fellowship, the von Humboldt post postdoc, the NATO NSF, and then the University of California President Postdoctoral Fellowship. These are very, very prestigious postdoctoral fellowships, and uh, uh, very proud of you. Uh, he also got an NSF extension for creativity. Uh, I think that was just before he became an assistant professor. He has been a member of editorial boards, and uh, he's also a co-editor of one of the journals in his field. He, he is an elected fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. This is a very prestigious uh, uh, honor, and not very many people get this award in the US. Uh, uh, he was the 2011 co award in science. So he's the third one speaking today, and he's the current chair of the FAS Board of Directors. Uh, I look at the uh, uh, Dr. Carlitos uh, Vita, and uh, there's a very interesting uh, highlight there. So he went, of course, as an assistant professor at the uh, University of California at Davis. And then after a few years, he became an associate professor. And I think within less than a year, he was promoted to full professor. And I could tell you that uh, that is a fit that doesn't usually happen. So I put here that he has one of the speediest promotion from associate professor to full professor. He's a distinguished professor in chemistry at UCB, and uh, he's also a distinguished professor in the biochemistry and molecular medicine, again, at UCB. He has been the chair of the Department of Chemistry at UCB. He has been the executive board of the American Society for Mass Spectrometry, uh, Academic Senate Faculty Distinguished Award at UCD, and uh, he has been a chartered member of an NIH study section. So that's a, usually a three-year appointment, and uh, you have to sit on every meeting of this, uh, of this study section. Uh, he also is also one of the founders of a company uh, that uh, is the topic te technically of what he'll be presenting today, and this is Evolved Biosystems, and I think uh, it's still ongoing. Uh, one of the highlights of uh, Carlitos records that he has so many publications, uh, at least 320 publications with at least 25,000 citations in an age index of 86. So that's very, very, very impressive. And uh, we are very proud that uh, he is with us and uh, he will be giving a talk on carbohydrates in the next generation of bioactive foods. So Carlito, it's your... Uh, it's your uh, time to uh, give your presentation and uh, let me unshare here. Great. Thank you very much, Ed. So it's, uh, again, it's always a pleasure to, to be a part of PASE and particularly in this time where, when we're all sort of sequestered, it's, it's great to, to connect in this way. Um, let's see. All right, so I'm gonna so I'm hoping everyone is hearing me and that you can see my slides. Um, I'm gonna talk about something that's, that's sort of different and um, something that we've been heading towards without realizing it, but, uh, and, and that is the future of food. And, and uh, if you think about what, where food is and where food was, if we call food 1.0 uh, during the hunter and gathering uh, uh, the hunter and gatherer phase where we, we essentially found food, we looked for it and we weren't very picky. It's, it's food that we could find, food that we could kill and food that we could eat. Uh, food 2.0 is the, 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 the greatest thing that's ever happened to us in the sense of being sufficient, uh, self-sufficient. We've had, uh, we could grow our own food, we could grow as much food as we want, in fact, Oftentimes we waste too much, but there's just so much food. And all of this is really just uh, 
accessible because of, of, of agriculture and how far we've advanced it. And we're now actually in the beginning of a new phase and that's what we call, we, can, we could call that food 3.0. And this is a, a much more precise way of nutrition um, and, and much more personalized. And so, uh, and so <clears throat> the next invention in food is really gonna be towards personalizing and trying to figure out which food is actually the ones that are, are best for us. And a lot of this is coming about because of what's the so-called omics revolution. Uh, and the omics revolution is really changing health and it's changing how we see food. And, and when I mean omics, uh, I'm talking about the genomics, of course, but really proteomics, transcriptomics, metabolomics, lipidomics, and so on. Uh, and a lot of these omics takes a lot of uh, really specialized and, and very expensive tools. And so these are the, the instruments the, the coterie of instruments that we use in my lab uh, for doing uh, advanced omics. Um, so we have an orbit trap, we have a, a QTOF, we have, uh, actually these are two different instruments, but I forgot to change the picture. So we have a, a nano LC with a time of flight, a nano LC with a QTOF, and then two triple quads, and, and soon we're gonna get another instrument. Uh, and when I was in, in the Philippines last time, someone, said, uh, someone asked me, why do you need more than one mass spectrometer? And, and I, I was advocating that we should have more mass spectrometers in the Philippines. And it's because they do many different things. You can't have just one because you need all of them. You need a, a lot of different ones just so that you can do different compounds. And so I would still advocate that we still need more mass spectrometers in the Philippines, but it's expensive. Um, this is, so we name our instrument. So the orbit trap, we call the orbit trap. And that's a $1.2 million instrument. The QTOF is 650,000. The chip TOF is 500. So we name them after TV characters like Jon Snow. This one we call Jon Snow because he keeps coming back from the dead. Uh, and then we have our, our triple quads. And the point of this is not that there's a lot of money there, but the point is that research is expensive. And it has to be supported in that way. And each of these instruments uh, required their own infrastructure. And, and so to, to really be able to do this kind of analysis and these types of omics, we really need the infrastructure that uh, allows us to do these things. And so I'm gonna start this by saying, um, if, there's, there, there's, if there's a food that we should be eating, uh, it's human milk. Uh, so right now in the table, there's, there's a war going on. Uh, some people think we should eat only meat. Some people think we should only eat vegetables. Some people think we should be a mixture of meat and vegetables. And so there's this war about what we should eat because we don't actually know what we want we should be eating. And so uh, we studied milk for many years now and I've given parts of this lecture before uh, but it's an important concept because model, uh, milk really is the model for the perfect food. And so if you look at what's perfect about milk, what, what is it, what's in the perfect food? Well, you have lots of carbohydrates, you have lots of fats, you have fiber, you have proteins, uh, and you even have peptides, and then you have minerals and salts and so on. And so, and so a food that has evolved with us is made up of really basic components that we actually already all know, right? Now, it used to be that we think that food was mainly for nutrition, it's for growing cells. But we know that's not really true anymore. That's, that's such a limited um, understanding of food. We know, for example, that food can actually train the immune system in infants. We know the right food, for example, um, we, were, um, <clears throat> the, the, we saw a dance lecture on, on, on vaccine and, and COVID and, and the synesis is, is, a, is a key word there because as you age, uh, your immune system doesn't react as well as it is when you're young. And so understanding how the immune system is, is built up when you're young, particularly through nutrition is really important. Uh, one function of, of the food is that it feeds a gut bacteria and not just one bacteria, but it feeds uh, sort of a, our, uh, 
constellation of many different types of bacteria that without, we would certainly, if not die, we would have be all quite miserable. Uh, and brain development. So there are some great experiments that show that having the right components of milk can actually develop the brain. And so from, from nutrition, which is really a very small component of what food does, to a greater understanding is really what we want to do. This is really where we want to be. We want to know what's in food, how, how it helps us. But primarily what we need to know is what are the structures of food. And so if we go back to human milk, one of the things that really made all this possible was our ability several years ago to characterize every single structure of, these, of this fiber that's found in human milk. It turns out human milk has these fibers that are called human milk oligosaccharides. And for the longest time, we didn't know what they did. And the reason why we didn't know what they did was we couldn't tell what the structures were. And so if you look at their structures, it's presented, it's presented this way in the liquid chromatogram mass spec um, uh, chromatogram. And if you look at it as individual structures with the, with the size corresponding to their abundance, it looks like this. And it turns out there's actually two types of human milk. One group of mother will produce these kinds of human milk and the others will produce this kind. And what we found was that if you put this mixture into this one very specific bacteria that we discovered, all these abundances will disappear. If you put them in a different type of bacteria, it turns out they don't disappear and they just go all the way down and become feces, right? Um, and so we, we, uh, we discovered that there were about 300 of these structures and we characterized them and we published several papers that really just characterize what these structures were, how they interact and how they actually uh, are beneficial to this one bacteria. The other thing that we found was that depending on where the, um, the mother was, or depending on where you were, where you grew up, uh, where your uh, ancestors were from, uh, there's a certain fraction of people who have either this kind of milk or this kind of milk. So uh, this kind of milk up here is one that's called a secretor, and the one down here is called a non-secretor, and that's represented here by the secretors as being blue and the non-secretors as being red. And so it used to be that people would say there are 20% non-secretors, but that's because that's what the European population was. And so because a lot of the research was done by Europe and US, everyone thought that there was only a 20% secretors. But when we studied milk from all over the world involving thousands of samples under the Gates Foundation, what we found was that the ratio of secretors to non-secretors are differed depending on where you were from. So for example, in the Philippines, there are about almost 30% non-secretors. If you go to Poland, it's about 20%. However, if you go to Africa, in South Africa, it's almost 40%. And India has really high levels of non-secretors. On the other hand, if you go to South America, say in Peru and Bolivia, you find that there are almost no non-secretors and they essentially have been uh, pretty much um, wiped out from the population. <laughs> What we also found was that this important bacteria that feeds, the, uh, that feeds on human milk was disappearing in the United States. And you could see here in Davis, California, only 25% of the infants have them. In Ireland, about 20%. But in, in uh, countries like Bangladesh and the Gambia, you see that they're almost in 80% of the, the kids. And so what we did then was we started a company to bring back essentially this, uh, this bacteria so that people in Davis will have, and, and, and in general, those who are deficient in this bacteria will have them. And that's the company that we started. And uh, I think on Wednesday, I'll talk to you about my experiences with starting companies. But anyway, the company itself uh, is now on its way to Series D, found, uh, found, um, a Series D. Uh, you can buy this in, in different hospitals. So, so far it's raised almost $100 million uh, in venture capital. And uh, science wrote an article about this a couple of years ago and they called it nature's first functional food, right? 
And so this is the uh, my, my collaborators who um, are co-founders of the company. David Mills is a microbiologist. Bruce German is a food scientist. And we're the analytical chemist who sort of uh, identify what these structures were. And so this is the, the product. You can actually buy it uh, on the web. It's now also available in hospitals. This is being, uh, they're performing clinical trials on infants and uh, in the NICU, those who are premature infants. And we think that uh, if you go on their website, you see the mothers really rave about what this product can do. So the other thing that, so there are other components of human milk and the other ones are, are the proteins. So there are a lot of proteins in human milk and one of the more um, important proteins, uh, uh, well, the more important protein is called lactoferrin. Uh, and we studied this protein also and what we found out was that this protein is modified, is post modified with this glycan. And when you put this protein in the presence of a bacteria like e uh, Salmonella and E. coli, what we found was that this protein blocked the binding of different Salmonella. So this protein was actually protecting the infant from getting pathogens. And when, when we started clipping off these different glycans, different structures from the lactoferrin, its ability to block also differed. And so it turned out that this is actually what's causing the lactoferrin to block the, uh, the, the binding of salmonella. And if you, if you make this, this, if you cut this off, then it no longer blocks binding. But the other thing that we found was that during lactation, this protein was actually changing its glycosylation. And so it was sort of uh, changing to address the changing variations uh, or the changing populations of different gut bacteria. And so this was actually then a, a very targeted uh, method whereby the mother was protecting her infant from different bacteria that is altering during the course of lactation. Uh, the, the other thing that we found is that human milk was also full of peptides. And, and so you could take a protein like beta casein and each of these lines represent all the different kinds of peptides that we see from beta casein. Uh, we also find it from all the other proteins that are there. And so no one had ever seen this before. And, and we wondered why there were peptides in, in human milk. And what we found was even more protection for the infant. And so what we did was we also developed tools, peptidomic tools, that allowed us to quantitate the site of glycosylation, as well as the protease, oh, I'm sorry, the site of uh, these peptide formation, as well as the protease that are involved in producing them. And when we started uh, picking up some of them and throwing them at bacteria, what we found was that they killed bacteria, right? And in fact, 62 peptides had about a greater than 57 sequence overlap with known bioactive peptides that are antimicrobial and those that modulate the immune system. So in this, what we found was that milk wasn't just nutrition at all. In fact, nutrition was a very minor component. Nutrition was lactose. Everything else was really to protect the infant. They protected it by killing pathogens, by blocking them from binding, and by actually uh, prevent, uh, feeding the good bacteria that can outcompete the bad bacteria. And so we're actually doing a little bit of COVID research and we're now seeing if some of these components will actually then block COVID binding. Because if you look at infants who are breastfed, they don't seem to be uh, getting the virus. So there's again, more protection that the mother has. And so now we know, again, as we said, that food is really nutrition but that is just such a minor component of food. And what made us realize this was that knowing that the structures, what the structures of food are. So the structures of food is important. So now I put uh, in front of you, so I, I love eggplants. And, and if you think about eggplants, there are just so many different varieties. And this is just a small number of them, right? There are Filipino eggplants, there are Chinese eggplants, there are eggplants from Europe. They're, I'm growing this in my backyard, these white eggplants, and they're really good. Um, but really, these are all the same species, but they're all very different phenotype. And so what you're seeing here is really sort of the post-genome. The genome told us a lot, but we, don't, we need something more now. What we need is really what differentiates not just species, but the individual. 
right? So I like to think of food really as the post-genome era. We're really officially in the post-genome era, right? Uh, and so if we look at food again, remember I showed you what the component of milk was. Well, it's composed of carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and metabolites, right? And also minerals. Well, we have tools for all these metabolites, we do metabolomics, fats, we do lipidomics, proteins, we have proteomics. What we're stuck on is carbohydrates. What is the structures of carbohydrates? And despite the fact that carbohydrates is the most uh, abundant fraction of, of all, nearly all foods, except perhaps for meat, uh, we know, or at least for all diets, we know actually so very little about it because we don't know its structure. And so we started training then our expertise in human milk oligosaccharides to look at the carbohydrate structures in food. And it's much more difficult. So carbohydrates in food can be made up of monosaccharides. It could be made up of oligosaccharides, which are chains of monosaccharides. And it could be made up of polysaccharides. And in food, you have all these different permutations. So you can have large polysaccharides, you can have oligosaccharides, you can have monosaccharides. And all these things, will, will um, behave differently and will have their own very special function in food. Um, and so uh, remember when I showed you the milk oligosaccharides and we found out what they did, right? That research took 80 years. So in the 30s, these milk oligosaccharides were known and they were known to be there, but only recently did we figure out that they're actually just food for the microbes. And it was because that we were able to determine what these structures are and the structures are very complicated. And so as humans, we always think, well, you know, well, we're much more complicated because we're more superior to plants. Well, as many of you know, plants actually have more genes than human. And if you look at the carbohydrates, their carbohydrate is actually a lot more complicated than ours. So this is the lowly potato. Potatoes actually have very different types of polysaccharides with many types of monosaccharides. And as you can see, these things go on for, for millions and millions of units long, and it's far more complicated than breast milk. And so the question now is, how do you determine what these structures are? Well, we've solved this problem recently. And so a lot of the publications are now really recent. Um, and the way we did this is we, we, uh, we prepared a sample, we acid hydrolyzed them, and then we labeled them. Uh, all in a 96 well plate format, so we can do this in a rapid throughput analysis, do liquid chromatography, use a triple quad, which allows us to quantitate, and then in a seven minute run period, we can see all the different monosaccharides. At, at this point, we see we can look at 22 monosaccharides and monitor them. And there's only about 15 that are naturally occurring, but it's a, in, in a seven minute run, we can see all these different things. And so if you could do this rapidly, and if you could do this uh, using um, this 96 well format, you could pretty much look at any type of foods. And that's what we did. So this is over 1500 foods arranged. So each line here represents a sample, okay? Uh, and blue here is glucose. And so this is low glucose food and this is high glucose food. And each of these different colors represent different monosaccharides. And so now we know what the monosaccharide compositions are of the food that we eat. And so we, if you want something that's rich in glucose, you can eat these foods. If you don't want rich in glucose, but say rich in galactose, you can go uh, in this area here. If you want something with fructose and so on, if you cut a slice of that, this is what it would look like here. Okay, so and some of these things are pretty exotic. So California, of course, is very diverse. And so there's a lot of different ethnic markets here. And so some of these, I don't even know. Uh, my students picked them out. But for example, here's a, uh, let's see, here's small red beans. Here's some, uh, I don't know what that is, sorry. Bell peppers, uh, ginger. So we also sometimes take uh, food apart and we'll look at the peel separately and we'll look at the flesh separately and so on. But in any case, you can do that. And when you do this, you can actually use some organizing um, statistics and you can group food differently. And so this is how, how groups fall into different patterns. And so these are foods that are high in glucose. And so that includes, for example, 
uh, tapioca, uh, uh, rice, and, and also um, a lot of uh, certain milks uh, and so on. On the other hand, if you look at this group here, then it's made up of the butternut scotch, uh, uh, butterscotch seeds, for example, fig skin, and so on. But what this allows you to do then is that you can sort of tailor make your food depending on the groups that you want, right? So for example, oh, here are yam leaves here, uh, yellow cherry pits. <laughs> so some of these are pretty funny actually. But in any case, so now we can separate food into different diverse group. And so we can then answer sort of a lingering question on food. So as I said before, we, we disagree a lot on what we should eat, but we all agree we should eat more fiber, right? And so there's a USDA guideline about eating more fiber. The problem is what's fiber? If we don't know what the structure of food is, how can we tell people to eat more fiber when we don't actually know what fiber is, right? Uh, and so for example, if you look at a Yukon gold, this is uh, my favorite potato. You can see that it's made up of glucose, but if you look here, you have galactose and you have fructose and a lot of other things. Now, on the other hand, a red potato has a different composition and so is a sweet potato and so on, right? So if I were to get fiber from any of these, even just one species, the different potatoes, the different cultivars of potatoes, I'm gonna get different fiber, right? So the question then is, what is fiber? And now we can answer that. It, well, it depends on where you get it from. If you get fiber from a Yukon gold, it's gonna be a different composition. And should that be the fiber that you're eating? Well, we don't know. But now we can do experiments to figure that out because we know the structures. And there's a lot of fibers that are actually sold. You can go to um, any, um, any uh, grocery store here in California and you can, and also um, health stores, and you can, you can see all these different fibers. If you look at the monosaccharide compositions of these fibers, what you find is that they're actually the same. And these are fibers that, because they're, that's mean they're good for you. It just means that they can uh, mass produce them. And so some of these fibers are all galactomannan. Some of them are sort of what's called inulin and so on. And so what we need to do is to figure out what fiber is the ones that we need and when do we need it. And then those are the ones that should be targeted for the right health, right? And so uh, if you look at the potato, I showed you that there's the, the composition, but what's really important is the linkages. So if I take these two glucose units together, uh, starch or amylose is really alpha 1,4. That means it's linked through the 1,4 carbons in an alpha position, right? Uh, if you look at cellulose, which is paper, it's beta 1,4, right? So just that change in linkage makes it a nice muffin versus a stack of paper. And so those linkages are really important. And so we need to know what those are too. We just don't need the monosaccharide composition. We, know how, we need to know how it's put together. And so we developed that method too. And so now this is the same graph, except now the blue here is glucose and different shades of blue is different linkages. So for example, uh, uh, the dark blue here is a terminal glucose, and then some of the different blues are 1, 4, 1, 3. And so we've created a library where we have 100 different linkages, and now we can do this and we can characterize food. And so now we not only have the monosaccharide composition, but we also have the linkages that make it up. And why is that important? Okay, here's different rice, right? Uh, this tells me that this is a, that, that's the fraction that's on the terminal. And this is one four. So this is a long starch and this is how it's, it's, it's stopped, is this terminal um, glucose. And so this kind of rice has low, um, a lower amount of branching than this because this one has a higher level of terminal glucose, right? So that means this two rice are gonna be quite different. However, it's still starch because you have this one four, one four linkage and a lot of other little less linkage. This rice here, uh, one of my uh, Italian colleagues brought it back to me, and it's it's a it's it's a totally black rice. However, if you look at it, it doesn't have the normal signature. It has the one four and the terminal, but this is one three. So if you were raised on this black rice compared to this rice, or compared to this this Thai rice, for example, or basmati, 
your microbiome will be quite different than that of those grown here, right? Or those raised with these different types of rice. So the, the, um, the type of rice that you have could be quite different and you would, you would sort of have cravings for that rice because that's the thing your bacteria is telling you to eat. And so you've heard a lot about how the microbiome is really important. You heard about how uh, we should be, um, you know, there's a lot of research now on the microbiome in, in the newspaper and almost every week uh, in Science or Nature, somebody pu publishes a paper on microbiome, right? So the state of the art in the genome is, is, is the tops, right? I mean, you can't, uh, I'm convinced in the future, uh, next to your toaster, you're gonna have a, uh, a sequencer so that you can see what kind of things in your genes are, or bacteria are in your kitchen, right? Where we fail is the tools for carbohydrate analysis, right? And so we could tell you what's in your gene, but if we can't tell you what carbohydrate feeds the bacteria, or we could know, we know what genes the bacteria have, but if we can't tell you what, back, what carbohydrate structures that correspond with, all we have is the, is the, the, the bacteria. And so that's why we're trying to characterize these things, because what we want to do is we want to partner, we want to pair the glycome, the carbohydrate, uh, carbohydrate structures, with the specific bacteria that is in your gut. So we want to, we want to pair the, the glycome with the microbiome. And to me, that is where personalized nutrition is going to be when, when, when it reaches the, the, the full nutrition. Okay. All right. However, there is one final problem in this, right? In that final problem, I told you what the monosaccharides look like. I told you what the, um, the, the linkage look like. One thing we don't know is the carbohydrate structure. If you have a long sequence, a polymeric structure that looks like this, how can you analyze it? And the only way to analyze it is if we break it apart and we make short oligosaccharide chains that we could then analyze with our liquid chromatography mass spec method, right? However, there's no method to do that, right? Uh, until recently. So what we did was we developed a method that we called FitDog. And this is actually just in press at the moment in uh, Nature Communications. And what it is, is it's a, if, uh, uh, a chemical-based method using Fenton's chemistry, a, a very old, 100-year-old chemistry, where you take this long polymeric carbohydrate material, you give it Fenton's, uh, Fenton's chemistry, and then you produce this oligosaccharide chains. And then these oligosaccharides, you can then analyze and you can determine what their structures are. And then you could put it together and give you what the polysaccharide composition or the polysaccharide chain looks like. And we call this fit dog, right? Um, so, so this is the, the, the method itself. Right, so you take a polysaccharide and iron and, and oligosaccharide. And so there's a little bit of whimsy here. Uh, we have two dogs uh, we call Reggie and Lucy. See, Lucy we call bat dog because her eye, ears look like a bat. Um, she has these gigantic ears. And Reggie is sort of chubby, so we call him fat dog. And I thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we named our method fat dog? And so we actually called it fat dog for, for uh, a few months and even a year or so. But then, because this was a project funded by Mars, the Mars Corporation, and they wanted to use this as, uh, they wanted to use this method to make dog food. We said, well, they said, could you change the name? Because we don't think that would match very well with dog food. And so we said, okay, well, let's call it Fit Dog. So it's called Finton Initiated Dissociation Towards Dissociation to Oligosaccharide Groups, right? Even, uh, <sighs> So anyway, that's what fit dog means. And if you see it in the paper, that's where it came from. So anyway, so now what we're doing is we're uh, looking at all these different um, sort of nodes and we're looking at different groups of these things. And what we're starting to do is we're now feeding these things to bacteria because in the end, what we wanna know is if you're, uh, if you're eating mainly group four kind of food, what is your bacteria? 
And if you if something if someone says they get ill, uh, they take uh, antibacterial, you wipe out your bacteria. How do we get it back to you? And what food do you eat to to do that? So in things like Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, we think this is going to have very therapeutic value. And so that takes me then to to this. There's many commercial probiotics. But how effective are they? And the problem is it's the Wild West out there in probiotics. A lot of the probiotics that are commercially available are, commercial, are, are, are sold because they can be easily grown. So a lot of them have very little to no clinical data. And I think once we know, as we know what the structures are, the carbohydrates, and that's what these probiotics eat, then we'll be able to pick the right mixture of sy what we call symbiotic, the right probiotic, and it's complement food so that we can treat people with different stomach issues. And the last part of this is a sort of newer work that we're doing. And it comes to sustainability. If you're eating corn, right? This is a corn plant and lots of corn is grown right outside of Davis. There are fields and fields of corn. If you eat corn, you're eating this, but you're eating such a small part of the plant. And usually uh, they just, they harvest this thing, they get out the corn and they throw the rest of the plant away. Can we eat more of the plant? Why, why can't we eat more of the plant, right? Well, it's because in my opinion, uh, we, we're, we don't understand the structures of a lot of the rest of the plant. And so we give it, we give it to cows or we make biogas out of them. But our contention is that a lot more of the plant that we eat should be edible. And so we've started mapping out the carbohydrate composition of corn of a whole plant. So we go all the way from the root and, and, and the various parts of it. And so the idea being, if we could characterize the composition of the carbohydrates, we can identify areas that are actually as edible as the corn. And not only that, we give a target to the breeders to figure out how to make the right kind of corn that not only gives you the ear, but is edible in different places. And so that's what this project was. And so we systematically cut up corn and we just looked at it at the different parts of it. And we did, because our, our, our methods of analysis are very high throughput, we can characterize all these different parts. And so this was, this actually started off as an undergraduate project. So a lot of undergraduates do research in our lab. And so we had this one undergrad who, who uh, who knew this farmer. And so we went to his, she went to his farm and actually picked out a, a number of corn. And then this then became uh, this. So, uh, and then this got analyzed. And so now this is actually then the composition in this case of just the stock here. And, but you could see here the different monosaccharide composition and so on. Uh, you can also pick out the different parts of the kernel uh, you can analyze the corn husk. You can look at the different inner versus the outer. Uh, we can look at the hair and so on. And so you can see then all the different composition. And again, the idea being, can we uh, find other parts of the plant that we can eat? And if we can't eat it now, can we change it in such a way that it would become edible, right? And again, if you go down further into the roots and so on, and that will then be, we could analyze all that. So mapping, as I said, the carbohydrate content of plants will allow us to eat more of the plant. And so in so doing, can we do more sustainable farming? Can we create foods and plants that are where the whole plant is actually eaten and not just the, the part that we eat now, right? Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank you uh, all for, your, for, for, for being here. Um, we receive a lot of NIH funding to, to look at this. We also get funding from uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has been quite generous in, in funding a lot of these sort of even crazy ideas with regard to food. And also we have a lot of corporate sp sponsors. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you, Carlita, for a very informative talk and uh, this idea of precision nutrition or uh, uh, personalized nutrition, very, very interesting. Now, uh, before we go into that question and answer session, I'd like to give Pedro an opportunity to complete his talk. Uh, there's a, 
a storm hurricane passing by the east coast of the U.S. and uh, uh, he had a power outage when he was uh, presenting his talk. So uh, if he is there, he could uh, complete the last few slides that he has uh, to to complete his talk. Uh, Pedro, are you, are you there? I'm not sure if he, uh, Pedro, we couldn't hear you. Uh, I unmuted myself. Okay, okay, you okay. You, we could hear you now, we could hear you and uh, you could pro proceed with your, uh, complete your talk. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, actually I had extension cords to, but unfortunately my accessory power didn't work. <laughs> Okay, so where we la left was there is a problem. Gastrin is important in the excretion of sodium. And thank you for listening to me again. However, there are other natriuretic hormones that are increased after sodium load. Dopamine produced by the kidney is also critically involved in the excretion of a sodium load. Aromatic amino acid the carboxylase converts L-dopa to dopamine. Renal dopamine is natriuretic and I'll be very quick. Here is a study by Zhang et al. And here what they did was the, they did a renal proximal tubule selective deletion of the aromatic amino acid decarboxylase gene. And you can see in here that this is the knockout. This is the wild type kidney. And, but then it's not knockout intestine or in the brain. So it is proximal tubule specific. Low salt diet, no problem with blood pressure, but a normal salt diet, they knock out mice at high blood pressure. And on a high salt diet, the blood pressure increased even more. So do gastrin and dopamine interact? And here we show that gastrin and dopamine receptor type one co-localized in human stomach G cells. You can see here's a gastrin in here. This is the mouse stomach tissue and here's D1 receptor and you merge and you can see a little bit of yellow here. So gastrin receptor increases the renal production of dopamine. Here's sodium, G cells, D1-like receptors, gastrin, and gastrin increases renal dopamine production. Food with sodium increases gastrin production and intestinal L-dopa synthesis. Carlito, you see, we borrowed from you. And gastrin increases the uptake of L-dopa. Here, gastrin enhances the uptake of L-dopa in human renal proximal tubule cells, resulting in increased renal dopamine production. Dopamine, vehicle, a little bit of L-dopa, same amount of L-dopa with a little bit of gastrin, not much happens, but when you increase gastrin in here, you can see that there's a marked increase in renal dopamine production. So increased sodium balance also increases renal dopamine synthesis independent of gastrin. And dopamine receptors and the gastrin receptor, that's the CKBR, are stimulated and you get a natriuresis. And here to just show you that the dopamine receptor and the gastrin receptor co-localize in rat with Kyoto renal proximal tubule cells. D1 receptor in green, gastrin receptor or CCKBR in red, you merge and you can see the yellow in here. And here low concentrations of systemically administered gastrin and D1-like receptor, phenoldopam, synergistically increase fractional sodium excretion. Again, fractional sodium excretion control gastrin by itself, the dopamine agonist by itself, but when you put it together, you can see in here, there is a marked increase in sodium excretion. So food with sodium increases renal dopamine production that may be mediated by gastrin in here. Gastrin, L-dopa, gastrin increases renal dopamine production. Dopamine receptors are stimulated. You get anatriuresis and blood pressure remains in normal range. But blood pressure is not increased in patients who have gastric bypass. You can see in here and you are kind of fat, you get a gastric bypass. This is gastric sleeve. You get rid of the part of the stomach. And in the Rowan gastric bypass, you entirely bypass the stomach. Indeed, the high blood pressure is normalized by gastric bypass in 38% in adults and 74% in adolescents. Actually, sleeve gastrectomy increases plasma gastrin and plasma glucagon-like peptide GLP-1 following a mixed meal, and GLP-1 is also natriuretic. 
Rowan bypass surgery prevents the increase in plasma gastrin following mixed meal, but increases plasma glucagon like peptide levels. And as I've already told you, GLP-1 or glucagon like peptide is not diuretic. And as Carlito already said, the gas gut microbiota can participate in this process by influencing the enterochromaffin cell production of serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And you can see here sodium goes into the stomach. G cells produce gastrin. Gastrin increases renal dopamine production. Dopamine receptors and gastrin receptor are stimulated. You increase sodium excretion. Blood pressure remains in the normal range. And you get help from gut microbiota, which, of course, I'm not going to talk to you about right now. So here, I have just three more slides here. Thank you. When called an idiot, sometimes it's better to be quiet than open mouth and remove all doubts. So I would really like to close my mouth soon. This is Confucius lecturing his disciples. Yeah, I saw this in the museum in Kyufu. And part of this presentation, I have to brag a little bit. It's given by the 2015 meeting of the American Heart Association, Hypertension, when I was given this award. And this award honors excellence in research and discoveries in the field of hypertension, as well as a researcher's contribution. The selection committee assesses the candidate's impact on their field throughout their productive careers, as well as any single discovery. And eight of the previous awardees have also received the Nobel Prize in Physiology, Medicine, or Chemistry. So the last one is, why should we not eat too much salt? Because it is a sin to eat too much salt. So there, it is a sin. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for laughing. And I always end with this something by Jewish because my mentor is Jewish. If I'm not for myself, who will be for me? If I'm only for myself, what am I? And if not now, when? Hillel the Elder and all these people help me to do all my research with funding from NIH. But the most important source of funding is NDJ, not NIH. NDJ, the initials of my wife. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pedro, for such an entertaining talk. I'm sorry that uh, you got cut up earlier, but uh, it worked out fine. And uh, thank you also for Carlito and that. Uh, I kind of realized that uh, what my doctor has been telling me about uh, salt, consumption of salt, as, as well as sugar, uh, are actually all true. So I think I, I should start following her to decrease my blood pressure levels. So, yes. So. <laughs> let, me, let me caution you a little bit. 16% of the people, if they eat too little salt, guess what? their blood pressures increase so you have to be careful In increase so there's a balance there's a balance there's a balance yes, yes yes if you yeah. eat too little yeah. uh, uh, it may not be very good for you okay 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 we can so, test your genes and i'll just charge you uh precision precision medicine yeah mm -hmm. and that with carlito's talk i also realized that uh, i am missing a lot of the uh, good food in milk the good nutrients in milk because uh I couldn't drink milk because of lactose intolerance. Uh, so I'm missing a lot of things somehow. But uh, in any case, we are in the question and answer session and uh, everyone is welcome to ask a question. And I think uh, Joel will have the first uh, question. Joel? Yes, thank you. Uh, congratulations, Pedro and Carlito for your excellent talks. Uh, my question uh, though goes to uh, Carlito. Uh, Carlito, I like the uh, your pairing of the glycome with the microbiome. I think that's really elegant, uh, but help me out with the conundrum I have in my mind. So let's say that's accomplished. Uh, how does that then relate to what is optimal health? In other words, how do we connect or link microbiome with optimal health. Is there somebody out there who's trying to uh, determine uh, the proper combination of recipe of microbiome that corresponds with good health? Yeah, this is <clears throat> this is the, the billion dollar question at the moment. There's a lot of companies trying to figure out what's a good microbiome and what can we, and there's a lot of people selling probiotics. Um, there's a lot of people, uh, there are some of the things that the microbiome does is it, um, for example, th this uh, um, this bacteria in the infant, 
it acidifies the gut. And so uh, what that means then is that when the gut is more acidic, uh, it prevents pathogens from, from uh, colonizing. And so you decrease the amount of antimicrobial resistant genes if you have a low pH. And when they've looked at babies, so there's one thing that they've been measuring forever, and that's the pH of poop. And in the early 1900s, the pH of poop was about, or baby poop was about 4.5. Today, it's closer to seven. Wow. And, and, and that's a big difference, but you can imagine in the adult, similar things are happening. Uh, so a lot of us are now sort of full with antibacterial resistant genes, for example. Uh, there's also other small metabolites that even affect the brain. Uh, and, and the problem is that uh, a lot of the research is focused just on the microbes. They, they don't focus on diet. And we now know that diet has a big way of yeah. establishing what the right microbiome is. So, so yeah, there is a, that's a, a really uh, important area of research. And I think it's hindered by the fact that we don't know the structures that are actually feeding the microbes in the gut. Okay. Arlito, can I add, or Joel, can I add something? Because we are kind of working a little bit on yeah. that. Uh, what uh, we are working on is actually with the gastrin. And we have not published this yet, Carlito, so I may need your help. For hypertension, this is not our work, is they have found that the, if the ratio of the firmicutes to bacteria, that is ratio is increased that's more commonly found in hypertension. And what we are finding is that with the, the gastrin knockout mice, of course, remember the, you need gastrin to secrete hydrochloric acid, so you will alter the intestinal pH. Right. And what we've found is that knocking out the gastrin receptor will also change your microbiota. And what we've found is that uh, you can alter the microbiota with different antibiotics. And depending upon the antibiotic, you get this and that and the other, so you can alter blood pressure. So maybe I'm not telling you the whole thing right now, but maybe Carlito, you can help me on this project. That's Always the good thing that. about this conference. <laughs> What's that? That's the good thing about this uh, symposium, the connections that we all make. Yes. Also, I wanted to tell you that inulin that you were, that is in the food there, actually inulin is not metabolized. And what we use inulin is that it is not metabolized, it's a small molecule, it's completely filtered by the kidney, and we use that to measure glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so, so let's proceed with uh, Gisela. <laughs> Gisela has a question. Gisela? Just a quick question, Pedro. Congratulations, first and foremost. Um, I was wondering whether there are um, uh, isoforms of gastrin and the gastrin receptor. Second question is, uh, what is your basis for saying that um, hypertension is 80% kidney and 20% um, uh, extra renal? So that. And then in the case of Carlito, uh, just wanted to know about um, cow's milk as a substitute for mother's milk? And is that uh, your product? And uh, Carlita second is, uh, what would you recommend for food considering that uh, diabetes and uh, high glucose is a major uh, metabolic syndrome uh, you know, all over the world? So um, what, what proportion of glucose and other monosaccharides and oligosaccharides would you recommend for our diet? Thank you. Uh, Gisela, can you repeat your question again for me because I'm old and I was following your question to Carlito. <laughs> yeah, so, um, well, I, I remember your work on the dopamine receptors and GERT4, and you were looking at um, uh, different variants of those in the populations, right? And now you're yes. looking into gastrin. So I'm just curious whether you're also looking at um, isoforms or variants of a gastrin receptor and a gastrin. Yes, uh, you are correct. We are looking at also at uh, those different variants. And uh, we are also uh, looking at the gastrin knockout mice. And then what we then do is to rescue 
uh, the gene of interest with the gene that is in that's carried by AAV virus. So we are working on that. That's one of the NIH grants that I have. We are not finished yet with that study. And the second question was? Um, the 80% um, uh, renal versus 20% extra renal. What's the basis for that? Oh, that's, the ba that's based on the cross renal transplantation experiments. So that when you transplant a wild type kidney to a hypertensive body, the blood pressure of that hypertensive body without the kidneys goes down a certain amount. And then when one now does the other way in which trans you transplant the hypertensive kidney into a normotensive body with no kidneys, then the blood pressure goes up. So when you do all those calculations, you come out with the with the notion that about 80% is renal and 20% is extra renal. There are other experiments that one can do and those people at Duke University, they think that with their method, about 60% is renal and 40% is extra renal. Thanks, Pedro. You're welcome and thank you. So Carlito, I think it's your yeah. turn to answer Giselle. Yes, th thanks Giselle for, for those questions. Um, Cow's milk is the, what's the substitute right now for an infant formula. Um, and, and if you look at cow's milk, it has uh, some milk oligosaccharides. Uh, this, we, we did an analysis on it a while ago, and there's about a 20 or 30% overlap in the milk oligosaccharides. So it's, and that's still pretty good. The problem is, is that it's very low uh, abundance. It's about a, a whole, factor of 10 lower. So to get the same benefit, you have to drink a lot of, uh, a lot of cow's milk. Um, so th the other thing for adults though, is that um, if you think about places in the world um, where cows started or cows were developed, they're like in Northern Europe and in places in Africa and if you go to those places, you find they have the highest level of people who are not lactose tolerant or who are not lactose intolerant. So they're lactose tolerant. And, uh, and so it's actually lactose into intolerance is actually the normal state. Um, we're supposed to be, uh, you know, we're supposed to be intolerant to lactose, essentially to stop us from breastfeeding longer than we should. Um, however, in those places where cows became available and were used, uh, it was such an adaptation that today there are no Northern European who are lactose intolerant. So you could, for them, so if you're lactose intolerant um, and you can, uh, you can drink, I'm sorry, if you're lactose tolerant and you can drink milk, you, you, you should, because it's a great advantageous uh, advantage to you. Now, as for uh, diet, what should we be eating? The, the problem with, with, with diabetes is that there's too much glucose. And we, what we should be eating then is perhaps food low in glucose. And that's why this library or this map of, of, of food will be really useful because you can substitute things like fructose, which uh, is not digested oftentimes if it's that different kinds of chain uh, or uh, food that's high in galactose or food that's high. So yeah, so essentially you, you want to try to avoid glucose uh, as much as possible. And you want to, if you do eat glucose, you want it in long, big polymeric chain that's hard for you to digest. So you can still feel full and you could eat as much as you want, but because, because they're not, the, the long, polymeric chains are not digestible. Uh, it just goes right through you. So, so I think that kind of a diet is not too far off in the future where we can sort of decide here are the kinds of food that you should be eating so that your, don't, your glucose level is not too high. So that's, that's thank it. You. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, Asuncion Raimondo has a question for Pedro. 
Uh, is Dr. Raimondo to her? Uh-oh. Yeah, she, she's yeah. asking, how do you increase gastrin so there will be more sodium excreted? Well, if you have the right gene and you put the right combination of sodium and minerals into your diet, then you'll increase gastrin secretion. The other way to do it is to bloat your stomach. And so that if you eat something that is non-nutritious, I guess, and the stomach gets bloated, then the stress in the stomach will increase gastrin secretion. Yeah, so you, you have to eat non-digestible carbohydrates. That's, that's, I see. That, that's what I'm saying, right, yes. Right, Pedro? Yeah. <laughs> that's correct. Do you agree, Carlito? <laughs> I agree. And that will increase gastric motility as well. And it will not only increase gastric motility, so you don't absorb a lot of your food, but will also, of your salt that you just took in, but will also tell your kidney to get rid of the salt that you've just eaten. Very interesting. So, any other has have questions for the three speakers, for Dan, for Pedro, and for Carlito? I don't see anybody who is uh, asking a question in uh, in Zoom in the chat. Can you so, ask questions for Doctor? Yeah. Uh, Go Bahia. ahead. Yeah. I've been eating uh, black rice because of my high uh, uh, sugar level. It, it worked. It uh, lowered my sugar level. But I saw that there was something different in, uh, in your presentation and, and the constituent of uh, black rice, Carlito. What was that? Uh, yeah, the, the structures of the glucose is different in that black rice compared to white rice. So if you don't have the right, if you don't have the bacteria to break that down, uh, then it won't it won't be broken down, or it's possible that the bacteria that does break it down that's in your gut is actually the one that's helping you. So, but structurally, black rice is is different in its carbohydrate than white than the normal white rice. Mm, okay, thank you. How about brown rice, Carlito? What is that? Brown rice, we didn't really see a difference. So I'm not, uh, brown rice may have the kind of, uh, the kind of fiber that's not digestible because they're, they're long, they're, they're these, um, the non, uh, what do you call that? The non-digestible starch. And that may be helpful in that way. And we, that part of it, we still haven't, um, it's still not that characterizable for us, determining what's um, digestible and what's not. But there are essays for that. That you can that you can use instead of the mass spec, so that we may we may include that into our analysis, so that we'll have a good picture of what's digestible and what's not. Yeah. So, I suppose uh, if no one else uh, has any question, uh, we're going to close the session. And uh, there were three very informative talks from three great speakers and. Uh, I think we learned a lot from this. I'm not a, I'm not a chemist nor a biologist or a medical person, but I learned uh, a lot from all three talks. And uh, we'll we see the future from Dan's talk. Uh, we see the future with uh, precision nutrition from Carlito. And I learned a lot from uh, Pedro uh, that I should listen to my wife as well as my doctor in, when it comes to lowering my blood pressure. So, uh, so shall we call it... Uh, Good night, good morning uh, in the Philippines, and uh, we'll all see each other tomorrow in some sessions. Okay, thank you, Edson. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. Congratulations to all. Exceptional thank you, Giselle. Yeah. Thank you, so much. thank you, Giselle. Thank you so much. Great job. Okay.